evening. Welcome to the Thursday, November 8th meeting of the City of Northampton Planning Board. Um, we are always starting our meetings with public comment on items that are not otherwise on our agenda. Uh, if anybody would like to make a comment about something not on the agenda, please come up and do so. Doesn't look like there is anybody who wishes to make a comment. Uh, so we'll move to the 7 p.m. item, which is uh, proposed zoning ordinance amendments to uh, items 350-12.3, first to create a waiver from tree replacement for net zero buildings. Um, would anybody on the board like me to read the suggested language, or has everybody read it? And shall we have some discussion? I have. Uh, I read it. I didn't read it. <laughs> Carolyn, would you rather explain it, or do you would like me to just read it? Um, well, how about if I start out with a reason for the change, yeah. and I have a couple of extra copies here if um, anybody needs it. Um, this, the ordinance relating the entire section related to significant trees was um, adopted about two years ago, actually maybe three now. Um, and the idea, and you've seen it now play out when applicants come before you, that they need to do tree replacement in accordance with the significant tree ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, as this has sort of played out in, um, through projects and we've required um, trees to be replaced, we've been logging the trees that are marked for coming down and the number of trees that have to be planted or pay or a fund um, be uh, of some monetary contribution to a fund um, is made. And so we've been tracking that. We've also heard um, from applicants that um, they, they don't quite understand, uh, particularly when it was related to creating a solar installation, that they need to cut trees to create an energy efficient building or, um, uh, or uh, ground mounted systems that w for which trees might need to come down so you just saw the one um, south of the landfill a couple of weeks ago they have to do tree replacement in accordance with this replacement criteria but they're creating this whole you know solar field so um, uh, so we've um, taken those concerns and um, talked through them a little bit about maybe there's maybe there's a way to tweak the language to allow some amount of tree clearing to um, acknowledge the fact that there is a good being created for solar installations whether it's on a building or if it's a, a ground mounted system and um, so that's the that's what generated the draft language changes that you see in front of you is, is just trying to tweak it to make it a little more flexible for the people who are trying to create um, you know 100 percent energy um, or, or um, um, renewable energy um, projects mm -hmm. um, and um, so that is that piece and then there is a second um, um, so I'll read specifically the language there and for some reason my section I didn't print out the site plan changes but I have that on text and you got that as well uh, but the, the so the biggest change would be adding another exemption to the tree replacement calculation that um, would allow the planning board to exempt a certain amount of um, replacements for the purposes of, create, of building up to 10,000 square feet of building, either in aggregate or single building. So that would mean it would be applicable to commercial buildings as well as residential buildings. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily just allow you know, free for all clearing of a site, but just for the purposes of creating a window for that solar access to those buildings. So you would evaluate, so the language um, would stipulate, stipulating that you would be evaluating that as part of your review and have the applicant show that they're only, the ones that are asking for relief from replacement are the ones that will create the shade for the building that they're trying to put, install solar panels on. Um, and in that paragraph, subsection six, um, it also goes on to um, state that um, 
it, this this uh, replacement relief has to be done within one year of issuance of the building permit. So in case a project fails for some reason after it's already gotten relief from the planning board, the next person can't necessarily just pick up the project without having a review, you know, if so much time has passed. Um, in this or this the document that I sent you in this section um, is slightly modified from what was actually introduced into council because the city solicitor reviewed it after it was sent to city council for referral. So mm -hmm. the text you have in front of you include incorporates some modifications that he recommended. So if when you take action, you should say as presented basically that it would incorporate those changes and then it moves on to City Council's Legislative Matters Committee, which is meeting on Tuesday, and they're going to take up this plus your recommendation before it goes back to full City Council. Um, there is another change that um, uh, staff is recommending to add to this, which is also in this um, document that uh, are in this paragraph and that is the provision that it would allow relief from replacement for the building but also for 10,000 square feet of area that would be allocated for a ground mounted system and so initially when it was introduced to city council it was just about rooftop building uh, rooftop mounted systems but this would give it basically the fair the same um, allocation for a ground system um, the second part of this um, change is that um, the replacement trees shall be deciduous or coniferous. So con adding coniferous was recommended by the tree warden um, who feels very strongly that um, we need a balance of trees in our um, city and that coniferous trees provide um, benefits throughout the year, or particularly when the deciduous trees are dormant. So he wanted that change. Excuse me, the conifer trees are, what kind of trees are they? Pine? Pine and hemlock, the ones that oh, okay. remain. Oh. Don't drop their leaves. Um, and um, <clears throat> the other recommendation from the tree warden was that um, the, um, this reference the tr city's tree list and planting guidelines, which was adopted officially by the mayor, uh, by the tree um, committee, that's not the right name, tree committee plus, um, and the mayor's office is, is acknowledged that that's our official city mm -hmm. um, guideline. Uh, and then finally, the replacement trees um, shall be a minimum of one inch caliper instead of two inch. Again, a recommendation from the tree warden because that um, they establish better at a, um, when they're younger. So that's I, this part of the ordinance. There's a second section that, that's, mm -hmm. that's part of that, but it's related. It's in the site plan section that we can go over next. I might yeah. be oversimplifying this, but so, there, so the ordinance doesn't allow to remove public shade trees, which are usually in the tree belt, so I get that. But you could have a significant tree, old growth tree in your yard, and it's okay to cut it down to put a PV panel and replace that with one inch caliper trees. It, that seems to go against what? Yeah. Well, it's saying we, have, we can approve doing that so it's not, but that, that is a concern. But a, a one, inch, is, one inch tree is like, is like this. So it's not that you're just replacing it with one inch. It's so it's for every, remember there's the it's calculation. It's the diameter to make up right. the diameter. But so if you literally, this is, this is a one inch caliber tree. So you could take down a 36 inch tree and replace it with a bunch of little twigs right. that are going to take 50 right. to 75 years to replicate what that tree was and in the process to put up a solar panel at the expense of a 100-year-old tree or whatever. That, the, I don't mind taking down smaller trees, but it seems like to knock down a significant tree, it's all coming from a good place and it's well intended, but it seems at cross purposes with what you're trying to do. Yeah, because one of the issues we have with the Olive Street is that big tree, right, that the lady come here and keep on asking about, right, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a big issue, um, I agree. Uh, and uh, 
Yeah, because it's, it's like this. How long would it take for the full growth of the tree in terms of energy right. production and protection? How you cal calculate that? I mean, I have no idea how to do that, and I have no sense on that. What? So how can we... So you're still replacing the total number. Of, so the calculation doesn't change. If you take out 50 inches of an old tree, for an old tree, you still have to replace it 25 inches in caliper. It's just that instead of starting out with a two-inch tree, so 25 inches would get you 12 trees at right. two inches or whatever. Now you have to plant 25 trees at one inch. Right. So you're still planting this the same number of inches. I, I get that, but yeah. it's, it's like in every development we have, if there's a significant tree, we zone in on that, say, where are the significant trees? Show me on your plan. How are you going to protect those? And, and which we should do. But now we're saying, so we don't even have that discussion. If they have that and they replace it with 25 one-inch trees, they could do <coughs> that by right to put up a PV panel. No, it's still part of your review. There's still okay. you still review it as part of site plan, but it does give it, you an exemption it, of a window. I mean, so let's say they're taking out a 50-inch tree. So yes, I guess in that case, if that one tree was blocking the future solar access of a building that was intended to be built, then. Um, then right they wouldn't have to replace that one tree so that would be zero mm -hmm. but you'd be looking at the plan confirming that um that in fact that tree was going to provide too much shade to the structure or the ground mounted system but if it met that criteria then automatically they would have the exemption or we would still be able to you would say, um the way this is written is you approve it but yes, it's written in as an exemption. Right. Which so, is yeah. A, yeah, could we legitimately not approve it? If, right. I mean, because it's just kind of like the math, right? Like, sort of like with the Verizon. Like, if they show this is my building and this mm -hmm. is the shade, like, how could we justifiably right. deny it if they're just showing that it's well, in the I, way of their solar panel? I think it would be on the margin. Like, so yeah. you could... So you could make sure that you have accurate data showing actually the path of the sun and that it will block and what the calculations are for where that access is needed and if it's only so they could claim i need to cut this tree down because it's just easier for them to cut it down and not mm -hmm. plan the site better so you have that ability to say well wait why don't you move your building over this way or reorient the roof or something so it might just be on the margin you might not be able to um, in every instance um, provide or not pr provide relief that's a double negative yeah. <laughs> so we can approve or disapprove it you need to what you're approving is you're making sure that what they're telling you is accurate in order to qualify for the exemption so you need to review the data. It can't just be them saying, oh, by the way, I have this plan for a house, and I'm putting it here, and I have to take the tree down. You need to say, you would say, show me tree the path of the sun, the show me you yeah. know, the hours of the day, all your calculus that went well, into saying. What if, it, what if it interfered but didn't eliminate? What if it reduced the solar exposure by 10%? I mean, what are the standards? Um, that well, if I understand this correctly, the only thing that triggers this is if a, a building of 10,000 square feet. I thought is, up, is to 10, up, up to 10,000. Up to 10,000, but it has to be a net zero building? Yes. Right. So, and how many of those do we see come in front of us? Um, more. more and more. More and more. Yeah. Yeah. Kent Hicks yeah. is building a lot of them. Mm. But let me just back up. This is triggered at the very initial site plan. Um, submittal so any site plan which is triggered at 2,000 square feet of construction or more but the the exemption allows for um, uh, installation of PVs on buildings either in aggregate of 10,000 mm -hmm. square feet or single building 10,000 square feet so if you have to clear a treed area um, in order to provide 
net zero energy and that's how you get to the percentage they need to show the calculation that um, how they're meeting how they're getting to net zero and if 10% or 15% reduction in PV access um, won't get them to net zero but that extra percentage will then that's showing that they can qualify I was going to say I, I would still be uncomfortable if in, in, def in defense of a developer, if they went through and they showed the calculation that this 150-year-old this beautiful tree that's loved by all in the neighborhood, but it's really screwing up their, their net zero building, and they want to take it down, and the guidelines say that they've met all the, the here's the data, and well, I've met the exemption, and we're kind of put in the position, well, they, yep, you're right, you've shown us the data, knock it down. I would be uncomfortable yeah. knocking a tree down of that stature for, to put in a, a PV array. <clears throat> so with, with this hypothetical, could we say no? Or no, yeah. not the way it's written. Right. Right. Okay. Do what latitude do we have now to, <clears throat> in the absence of this language, like the no. uh, we we can't overrule or we can't provide a waiver in in the form of a condition or something. No, at and this I, point, like we can't do a case by case and say like, oh well, your project is so good and it's <clears> only, <throat> you know, it's like twenty and a quarter dbh or you know, like right. we don't have the latitude to do that right now. Right. So the solar fields in Carfa that came yeah. in front of you, yeah, they're I forget the number of trees, but they have to take out I don't know twenty trees or something. Um, you couldn't say, oh my goodness, you're creating a five megawatt yeah. um, system. Don't worry about the trees. You have no latitude for that at all. And I don't, I mean, these numbers aren't magic for 10,000 square feet. Um, so there is, I mean, if you feel like it makes sense for some amount, but maybe not, maybe this is too much, that can also be a recommendation back to city council. So I think I, we, just, we just need latitude because the way it's written yeah. is you could have a, a public shade tree right. that was just planted last year as part of the, the tree planting program, and that, that's off limits. But the 150-year-old tree that's on your property, if you meet the criteria, you can cut it down, yeah. and that doesn't make any sense to me. So I, I, would, I, I would think a significant tree, old-growth tree, is as important as a public shade tree, and I would put those, at, or at least to give us the option uh, some wiggle room to say if you meet all this criteria and the and the, and, the, and the tree significant but but it's it's off in the corner or, or what out of there's something right. you know some <coughs> circumstance that it doesn't bother us then okay I guess right. I could see like that. is it appropriate for the language to not include the section about qualifying for an exemption so much as the planning board has latitude to evaluate the shade tree requirements for projects of X, Y, Z, you know, criteria, as opposed to setting us up for like, you know, the, like a more black and white, and being kind of snuck. almost like at the very least you need to meet this criteria, but that's, but it's still open to review. <clears throat> I don't know. It, it's tough for a developer, but I think it's I think it's also tough to, uh, I mean, if you had specific, um, um, if you if you change the language to may be approved mm -hmm. if you meet, you know, and there's no other way to um, address, you know, PV access. But then you run into the um, problem of being arbitrary. You right. know, deciding right. on right. one applicant is right. going to be different from someone else who presents very similarly. Right. But you say, oh, sure, you don't have to replace anything. So that's the tricky part, I think. Um, I, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I have another problem with it, which I think you kind of thought you were going, you were coming close to stating. What if there's a tree? I mean, solar is great, but so are trees. Uh, <coughs> and it could be that it's a tree or two or three trees that are important to the neighborhood, maybe an immediate neighbor. And um, it would seriously, um, uh, undermine the quality of life in that neighborhood in order to get solar energy. Well, solar energy is great, but it's not the only good thing to strive for uh, in society. So I, I'm not sure how to balance it. 
Yeah, I mean, I will just say that this is, and all the ordinances are just about on the within the property boundaries. You all actually only through special permit really can you evaluate what the potential impacts are on trees on other properties or potentially subdivision review. So, um, and and in fact. Um, you know, lots of things can happen on an individual property that may affect trees on other properties, but that property owner is not responsible, responsible or liable for that. Right. So this is really just about your you're looking at this. You know, for site plan, you're just going to be looking at trees. And yes, there's been a lot of debate about the value of trees. Um, we've Including also had here. Yeah, right. right, right. We've also had a concern about projects that increase the cost for um, affordable housing development. So we've had those couple of houses, a couple of projects that Habitat has taken down and they're building net zero buildings and they're building affordable housing and then they have to spend a lot of money on tree replacement. So, I mean, maybe that becomes <coughs> part of the criteria that you look at, how many goods are being provided as yeah. opposed to just net zero um, energy. Um, but that's sort of, that's also was fed into the rationale for providing the ordinance. It, I'm still, I still don't really understand. Why do you guys, why, why do you want to change this? Because there have been <coughs> um, a couple of significant projects, including the affordable housing projects that on Glendale Road and Burt's Pit Road, where there's a significant amount of money that has to be um, set aside for tree planting and tree replacement um, uh, for the purposes of, um, you know, under this ordinance, uh, the, um, this was triggered because of the projects that are happening. The other piece is the project is not just about deciduous trees, it's about coniferous trees. So especially on the Glendale Road area, not just the habitat project, but the other project farther down there are a lot of pine trees coming down and it's the cost the price the cost adds up <coughs> if you have a whole you know you know 40 acre parcel and you're cutting x number of trees just in a small portion of that um and you're doing it for solar gain the applicant is still required to then expend a lot of money to replace those trees um, so it's just trying to balance, could, could trying you, to create a better balance. Could you all. have the same wording, but 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 the significant tree aspect would trigger not site plan, but special permit review, so that it's if in the instant it, it seems somewhat limited how often this is going to come up, um, but when it does, because they're if if they're taking down a non significant tree and replacing it with the same caliper with however many, the one inch tr tree thing still bothers me, but th they replace it in kind, I'm okay. But the significant tree, it would seem like that, maybe maybe that's the workaround that, that triggers a special permit which mm -hmm. tells the developer, to me it's like, it's like a site, if you have a sloping site or if you have a rocky soil site, that's the site condition. If you have a significant tree in the middle, that's, that's a site, the site condition, condition that you need to work around, you don't just. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I would be slightly concerned that that we kind of start like chipping away at this the concept of significant trees that we've like worked really hard to get in here but i think there's probably language we can find that won't do that but it feels right now like we're on like a little bit of a slippery slope towards like ending up adding in yeah affordable housing or adding in all of these other reasons to to undermine the significant tree protection uh, I, mean, I, I guess it, i mean it, it's, it's I, I understand the affordable housing thing, and I guess if a development is all affordable housing, it's not some thing where the developer pretends to do it. Um, you know, what, where, where's the, can't there be an exception there? <coughs> That's a good point. I mean, I'm not, not talking about that project. I mean, that, so both, so affordable housing and net zero. Yeah, and if you were doing, like, so in other words, that is protecting the Habitat for Humanity uh, developer, but that's not protecting the developer who, you know, said that they were going to do something and then 
didn't or it, industrial or it, you know yeah. doesn't do something and so I mean because I I fully understand if what you're what you're saying is we want to help affordable housing because that's its own we want affordable housing and we want net zero so if both of those things are met then great but if it's something else then Mark's right it's just it's part of the it's part of the site you got to deal with it you know shouldn't have bought shouldn't have bought that property <laughs> <laughs> can you make this distinction between on the land on the if it's for affordable housing and that you can make a recommendation to the city council that it be amended to include um, also a provision for affordable housing, although I wonder if that would, I'm just going to ask Wayne, do you think that would trigger a requirement for another public hearing because it's getting a little bit more stringent? Or more expansive? Can you relax the awards less? Right. So given where you are now. Oh, I see. You're still not. Right. You're not, you got it. Yeah. Okay. Is significant tree a defined term? Yes. What is it? It's a tree over 20 inches, DBH. And right now mm -hmm. it's um, deciduous. Uh, no, it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's either deciduous or coniferous. It's all trees over 20 inches. Go ahead, Trey. So this is where it gets a little funky because just the short time I've been on the board, we've had some projects where the trees are bigger than 20 inches, but the the arborist, the professional arborist has gone through and said, well, it's diseased or it's, you know, it's not healthy or it's on its last legs or it should come down. And in some ways they would be significant trees. So I'm a little, it always comes down to kind of the city tree warden versus the arborist on the developer side, perhaps. No, so actually that exemption is still there. We haven't touched that. So there are other exemptions for how, why you wouldn't have to replace a tree, and it's whether it's diseased um, or dead. But the, applicant, it's the obligation is on the applicant to have an arborist um, certify that it's dead or diseased mm -hmm. and why. And um, then that becomes part of the review that the board does, but at, sort of in the background, staff, meaning the tree warden, will look at that and say, yeah, that makes sense to me. So it's not real, it, it shouldn't be, although sometimes I would imagine it would, it shouldn't be, you know, one against the other. Yep. And, but to me, that would be, that would make sense if we if, if on the outside this significant tree looks beautiful but they did their due diligence and found out you know what it's disease it, it and it needs to come down the tree warden concurs then you're like okay thank you for your work you're we're good right. but if it's healthy you already have that yeah, yeah and it's a tree that's been there for five generations but but it, they meet the criteria i would hate to see that come down just because just because right and as written it, you know it seems like there's this tension between just qualifying for the exemption based on criteria and our approval. Like our approval doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like we need to, that we don't, we're not really providing approval because it's just people meeting a technical requirement yeah. and, then, and then we're <coughs> stuck. So it's sort of like. Well, you're, you're reviewing it to, to confirm that in fact yeah. they have done a site design, you know, in a way that, um, as best they can to avoid those yeah. trees and then there it's not just the easy solution um so you're sort of checking the the assumptions can, can i ask a question uh, so and I, i'm not just because it's the most recent so for example in the last meeting there was a uh, someone who wanted to build an 11 unit place and uh they we said and, and that hearing is still open. That's hearing is still open. But my my point my point is is that in terms of checking the boxes, if one of those boxes like the is that you know we we say well you did need to have seven pro, you know seven units, and that will make the site work for us. Is that I mean is it a technical thing that the site works or is it a or is it a seven, you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is. If there are trees in some of those. Yeah, I mean, I'm saying like la the last time, like 
it, the the hypothetical the I'm sorry not last week the hypothetical version of a seven of a so we say well you know we'd like the prop your thing to be smaller than than you are putting forward it, are we I don't th I think I know where you're going you're, you're suggesting that if someone says um, in order to make all my seven units um, PV and net zero and PV yeah. on the roof with net zero I need to cut 10 trees down yeah and therefore I want relief from having to do replacement yeah could you turn around and then tell the applicant well no if you only did six units you wouldn't have to cut all 10 down exactly that's what I meant to say. no I think the alternative would be no you have to replace I mean if you felt that I mean you get up to this let you up to 10,000 square feet if there's yeah. no other way to orient the site and those trees have to come down then you say okay there's no way to orient this I don't think you get to subtract the development you could say no you have to replace um, okay. the trees mm -hmm. um, okay. no I mean I was just like you know if the trees are in one corner but you keep on wanting to build you know, because it's one thing that it's in the middle, right? right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like, it's in the middle. I need, to, <laughs> need it to go, right? Yeah. But it's another thing if it's on the side and you want to continue to build seven. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, the way it's written now, I would say you wouldn't be able to say, no, you only get six because it does allow for up to aggregate of 10,000 yeah. okay. square feet. Mm -hmm. um, so you would then be looking at the rooftop. How much of, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Do you at six is that ten thousand, yeah. and then maybe the, for that other thousand square foot footprint, they have to do the replacement for the trees that shade that one or something. So there's there's five kind of exclusions here, right, for different kinds of trees. Would it work if we just put in there a sixth exclusion that significant trees, as vetted by the tree warden, may also be excluded from this calculation well no that's what number six is a proposed addition to the exclusions oh, but so not yeah. by the tree warden because this section is under the planning board's jurisdiction when something comes to plan to uh planning board. no but the, the 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 definition or the uh <clears throat> the the, the, the somebody has to say that this is a significant tree as mark was saying the example that mark's using Who's to say what a significant tree is? I mean, we just did uh, the solar array over in f and by uh, the orchards there that yeah. we just approved, and they took down those 20, 30 trees that cops in the middle. Yeah. There may have been a significant tree in there. Right. They have, but that's are. before. Yeah, that's before any of this even. No, I, I understand that. I'm yeah. just using that as an example. Yeah. Right. So, so that they do. They're on for replacement. They put a table in their plan. Right. So the significant Total trees inches. are defined in the zoning as anything over 20 inches, uh -huh. unless you fall under the exemption of having diseased or dead or something. Uh -huh. So they didn't present any information about any of those trees being dead or diseased. Mm -hmm. So all of those, they have to replace. Um, and account for all of those ones over 20 inches because the zoning says you're over 20 inches you're in this category of significant right. tree right well so then I guess the question is is there is there another part of this ordinance outside of the exemptions where we could address net zero projects like rather than casting it as like here's significant tree is and then here's all the reasons that you wouldn't have to follow the requirements like instead of section d like can it be can it be in a different section where it gives us more latitude to evaluate without it just being like a hard and fast oh exemption, exemption you know where it's like because it's like requirements shall not apply to this 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 right. this and this and, and that's so hard like you know that's so inflexible yeah is there a way to for what purpose or by what standard well I mean I guess that's that's kind of the next question if if we think that it's worthwhile to begin questioning the the value of replacing significant trees for net zero energy projects I mean again I do think it's a little bit of a slippery slope we could say oh but also affordable housing is great but also you know right. this other kind of project is great like that is a concern but it but it seems like a first step would be maybe not casting it as an exemption. 
<clears throat> and just kind of moving it into, you know, I realize that that doesn't provide a developer with certainty that a developer might want, but I think you'd probably, yeah, right, you would still want to spell out why the board might waive the replacement. I'm just pulling up section 12.3, so I think I understand what you're saying. So there's the, it starts out with, um, you know, intent of the ordinance is section A. Mm -hmm. B is, no, you know, stipulating that no one can move a, a significant tree associated with any site plan or other zoning relief. Mm -hmm. uh, the removal of, and so you, there's a 12 month look back, which is sep section C. Then there's this section D, which are exemptions. And then, um, Section E is any person removing a significant tree is subject to this section shall sat satisfy either of the following conditions, provide for replacement trees, um, and then that's where it goes through. And, and there's this section here um, in your ordinance anyway saying here mm -hmm. are the, how, how, you, how you do replacement right. or pay into the fund. Um, and then there's protection of significant trees and then record keeping. So I suppose... You know, under E, you could say must satisfy these conditions, and then um, you could have potentially a waiver provision by the planning mm -hmm. board if the board finds that it meets, you know, and stipulate what it is. But you're still, so that's not necessarily an automatic exemption, but you still should identify why, so that you're not just right. doing it randomly, that you identify why the board yeah. might consider a waiver from the full replacement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, that's like the hard question. It's, yeah, is it, because we talked about this even with solar down the meadows and such, like, you know, it's right. not like using megawatts of a project is not really like the best metric anymore. And like, you, you know, like there's, I don't necessarily feel equipped to be able to say that, you know, here's the three reasons that I would feel comfortable chopping down a significant tree. I, I don't know what those yeah. would be. I don't know that I'd feel comfortable with any, you know, <clears throat> unless we saw that we were really losing out on really important energy projects, you know, if, if really important you know, citywide projects weren't getting built. I think it might be. And what, can, can we not connect this just to the affordable housing piece? There's an exemption for affordable house, for, for projects that have over 50% affordable housing as their, uh, and, and that's it? Instead of net zero. Energy. Well, net, the net zero and have over <coughs> over fifty percent of their their properties are are and ground mounted used. solar too. I mean, so I feel like we could get end up with like a list of like ten different things if we really start thinking about it. Like, <laughs> so it would have to be um, solar panels that are part of a net zero construction. Is that correct? Um, so there are two different, um, <coughs> the way this is written, there'd be two different um, scenarios. Either, um, yes, it would be part of construction, so it would be a roof-mounted system, so um, for the net zero buildings. But you could have ground-mounted to, to get to net zero, yes. Um, so, but, but just to clarify, if it's solar panels alone don't, don't make it. It has to be solar panels that are part of a net zero right. project. Mm -hmm. In one scenario for building, or it could just be 10,000 square feet 10, of ground square feet of oh. a ground mounted system that's sort of a standalone that is not associated with any buildings. Like Sincarfa. Right. So if somebody says, I want to, I want to cover my roof with solar panels, but for whatever reason, it's not a net zero building, they don't qualify. Right. Um, not entirely clear to me why. Solar is solar. 
Well, because it's really just pushing you that much farther. We yeah. shouldn't give a re we shouldn't give relief just for solar, because um, we want to make sure there's more than. I mean, we our mission, and we're going to talk about that later in the meeting. Is we have this goal to reach um, you know, carbon be carbon neutral by 2050. So we can't just you know. So that goes back to well, there are benefits to trees. So you really have to provide a benefit. If you're going to be cutting down <clears throat> trees, and that that increased level of scrutiny is net zero, not just throwing some panels up on your roof. But the, that it's almost the implication is you need solar panels to have net zero, and that's not the case. I mean, you can get right. net zero in in other ways. And so, I mean, with a, you know, if it's a super insulated building and geothermal <clears throat> wells and all, you know, you can, there's all there's different ways. That cumulatively you can get net zero, mm -hmm. um, and we're saying we're we're associating only solar panels with net zero. Just burning piles of cash. <laughs> <laughs> That's not energy. Yeah. <laughs> um. Right, but the, the, so that goes into the other, not everybody can do, you know, geothermal or those other elements. So, right. and PV can get you there when you might not otherwise be there, and you're only asking for the exemption for the purposes of providing PV. So even if you could get to net zero, I know this is the, sort of the other side of what you're saying. Yeah, no, I just, see, it, I'm, yeah. it seems, it's, it seems too squirrely to me. Like somebody could take advantage of it and 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 chop these big trees down. That we'd say no, that's not what we intended. But they say, well, that's I've met all the criteria, so that's what's going to happen. And and we've we fought and we've had developers agree on on uh, residential developments to replace significant trees, you know, with three inch caliper trees. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're talking just the the one inch caliper and the the inability, the way it's written, to, to have a second pass or another say at the loss of a significant tree, um, um, is, I'm just not comfortable with it. So I, I don't know what the wording should read, but I, I'm not comfortable the way it is now. Well, you could. Uh, what the city council think? Or, I mean, the city. So they haven't seen it yet. They've not seen it at all. I mean, the only what happens, uh, the path is that if there's a proposed ordinance, it goes to city council. They don't discuss it. They just throw it out for okay. public. I mean, they push it out for yeah. public <laughs> hearing. Um, so what happens? So this is the first part of the public hearing. Yeah. Then the city council subcommittee that focuses just on ordinances has its public hearing. Sometimes okay. you do it jointly. In this case, we're not, right. which maybe would have been beneficial because they could hear your whole discussion, but we'll just send them the TV, the video. Yeah. <laughs> um, Exciting. So, <laughs> so um, <laughs> they're going to see it on Tuesday. They, um, what happens is, you know, you could recommend that the language be modified. You could sit here, roll up your sleeves, and work on text that you would be comfortable with, or you could say, no, nah, I don't like it. <laughs> And send it on with a negative recommend recommendation. So those are your options. Mm -hmm. You know, if you you could also s conceptually say we think the language needs to be changed to allow more flexibility for the board to say no, and also to include these other goods like affordable housing. Or mm -hmm. maybe one thing we haven't really talked about is what if you have a huge acre that's for you know a huge parcel, and you're really only cutting in on two acres of forty. Um, but there are a lot of trees where you're cutting and you're trying to do net zero. Does the fact that you're protecting all the remaining 35 acres or 38 acres, does, is that something that helps? You know, maybe you're, maybe you're permanently protecting op the rest of the open space, but yet you're bound to replace in that small area that you're building. So and the, that's not part of the net zero calculus? Well, it could be, but you're, you guys are moving towards um, wanting to understand more benefit than just net zero. So what I'm suggesting is maybe another piece of the equation is dependent upon how big the parcel is and how much of the parcel is permanently protected from future development or something like that. And um, since there are so many factors and so many different components of, of this, I mean, is it, how problematic is it for us to have wider latitude? Like, would it, 
not work to just have a more blanket ability for us to evaluate granting you know an additional exemption like if section d is one through five and then six Shh. is you know or with approval of the planning board based on an evaluation of the project benefits or something like is yeah, that too I mean, broad to say well what you could do and i think mark or somebody said it before was you could have that a special permit criteria instead of having it under the site plan you could say oh and if you want this exemption it triggers a special permit and the board's going to be looking for x y and z mm-hmm. um and that you know special permit is broad we, we encourage yeah. language that would you know hone that down but it still gives you latitude to turn down the request mm-hmm. for the exemption so i mean you could also put that out there as a recommendation to um the city council <clears throat> that you think it should be special permit because that gives you more leverage i mean it still seems like that mm-hmm. I, I i think i'd be okay with that yeah. it it seems very limited we're, we're what i'm saying is that if if you have to cut down significant trees in order to put up your pv array then we want to talk about it if it's if it's if it's smaller trees if it's 20 19 inches or below meet the meet the schedule as defined and you're good right. um and and i think that would show the applicant that significant trees are important because then you're, you're just talking about the value of a tree if you know how many years does this net zero building have to run to <coughs> offset chopping down a hundred year old tree yeah. you know, so in a top that's what i was thinking about yeah, yeah because how you calculate it they calculate right. that for us and how does that work yeah so mark are you suggesting that if this um triggered special permit then that would only be in the case of solar like only you know not other benefits that somebody couldn't necessarily want to seek some relief for having for doing affordable housing for example <clears throat> you know yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a different. I I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I think that's a different discussion. If yeah, this no, is, I don't. I mean, if this is in regards to trees that, and net but, net zero building. Yeah. Then my suggestion would be. One of the things I'd like to see is if people use the same formula for deciding, you know, deciding what they're going to do. So, you know, one of the problems is that. I don't th- I think everyone is using I'm assuming everyone is using a bunch of different formulas and bringing them in and then just arguing their case but what they should be formulas yeah. they the same it's the same formula for we have the in terms of measuring like yeah. where you measure no no I'm saying that in terms of in terms of in terms of saying that 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 this project can't move forward without this tree being cut down in other words right. they that they've you that they've looked at the property and they've answered that the project the project can't be done like can't be done is different than it's going to cost me an extra fifty thousand dollars because it's going to cost me an extra fifty thousand dollars well that's on you like i'm not benefiting from that but but you know you can't do it is a completely different thing but i think that's a perfect analogy because we've had a lot of those discussions where developers have said you know we've looked at different orientations of this building it has to we it, it's going to work best if it sits here but at the sacrifice of these two significant trees and then we have a discussion about it right. but the way this is written we wouldn't have a discussion yeah. and so i would say it's the same things if that triggers a discussion then let's talk about it right i i think that you could i, I think you would want to frame um, special permits not as to whether it becomes too much of a cost factor for someone but it's really about what benefits are there for the community um, to allow for that exemption so affordable Mm -hmm. housing is a benefit for the community net zero is a benefit um, for the community Um, you know maybe open space pres- preservation is a benefit to the community mm-hmm. and not necessarily maybe not dictate exactly what those things are in special permit but you could say that because of special permit you're going to consider other community benefits that are a result right. of the project yeah i think that makes sense not yeah. ju- i'm not sure the presence or absence of um 
the tree only relates to solar energy. Right. You could say that, as you just said, Carolyn, the, it's a community benefit that can be looked at in the context of this list of other community benefits. If, if, the, if, we've already, if it's already written, we've determined that a, that a significant tree is a community benefit, and you're proposing to take it, to knock it down, then in this context, we'd say that triggers special permit, and we want to know how the community will benefit more at the expense of what we've already determined to be a benefit at, you know, with the existence of a, this significant tree. It's like benefit replacement instead of tree replacement. Right, yeah. right, <laughs> exactly, yeah. So would we do that, though, through an exemption saying, exempting applicants who seek relief from tree replacement through the special permit process? Or how would we? Yeah, so basically, if you added a special, if you say the planning board could allow an exemption by special permit, then what that means is, as you know, if the applicant had just needed a site plan for their normal project, they would then secondarily have to ask for a special permit if they wanted a, to seek relief under this. So okay. it would be a so separate. So six would just be a simple applicant seeking relief through planning board special permit process. Right. So you have there are other examples of that in the code. So um, I mean, that second curb cuts in different more. districts require a special permit. Yeah. Whereas someone might be just be coming for a site plan, but all of a sudden because they're adding a second curb cut, it needs special permit. Mm -hmm. So it's similar to that. Does that still put us in a position, though, of when somebody comes asking for that? I mean, how are we, how would we be evaluating it at this point? I mean, I, I understand and agree in principle that we'd be having a discussion about that and trying to figure out what the benefit was, but at that point we have no criteria on which to evaluate that? I mean, is there well, any I way think to... It would, I, yeah, I mean, there's the general special permit criteria and the board has broad discretion to deny a project but I think it would be important to identify the types of things that make sense um, for allowing, and not necessarily to just confine it to those, but to hone in on the things that may mm -hmm. lead to approval of a special permit, like net zero, um, what, whatever you think, if it's affordable housing or if it's, you know, permanent, you know, a large swath of permanent, or, you know, so many acres or a percentage of the property is permanently protected open space or something. And I mean, frankly, I haven't thought about the <laughs> potential, so I can't, I, I mean, well, I, think I don't know the numbers that. that you'd want, but I think it makes sense to define it so it's not open-ended one so that people right. understand what they're in for and they don't sit in front of you or stand in front of you and argue to the blue in the face about what they think a benefit is and the board doesn't really know how to deal with it if right. they're not in agreement. I mean, right. they could mm -hmm. just say no because mm -hmm. it's special permit. But. <laughs> so, because you're having this kind of issue, uh, experience of uh, like the Olive Street, right? A special permit and then people start to question us about, oh, so but uh, how you define this? How you define that? I mean, <laughs> don't you have to be more specific? You don't have to, I mean, that's the, that's the thing about special permit is the board has the discretion to determine whether or not yeah. the criteria is being met. Can, can, Wouldn't it be can, advantageous to put the standards in the ordinance so the applicant knows? So, I mean, I'd, I'd be comfortable with the three, three areas that you just referred to. I mean, that could be the starting point of criteria referenced in the right. special permit, among all the other special permit criteria. With regard sure. to tree replacement, you know, we consider net zero energy, affordable housing, and open space preservation to be benefits, project benefits, and then right. leave it at that. Yeah. Can you push, but, can we say, because I think we're all, I think there's an agreement that we like the special permit component, <laughs> but can we push the, can, the things we're looking for to, City Council and say, hey, you guys are the voice of the people. Can we give me five things that uh, need to be part of this? And, and we will, as planners, say that, you know, we will see, <clears throat> keep to those things. Yeah, I mean, what we could do is take your comments about this and your, you know, if you vote to recommend this move forward, but at special permit and what the City Council committee may do is 
you know, I think in the meantime, staff would provide them with mm -hmm. possible language. They might kick it back to the planning board as part of this, just because many times they want to make sure the planning board's comfortable with language. Yeah. So alternatively, you could, um, you know, keep the hearing open. So, um, well, I mean, come that, back all, uh, automatically. Isn't this going no. on? And it's going to come back. No. So it's this is the official public hearing. You make a recommendation to council. Okay. I guess you can't really keep it open. You'd probably want to. Um, I mean, they. W what would happen is we would bring it back and we could re-advertise it if they send it back. Is probably the cleanest way to do it. Um, yeah. So. Uh, so they may opt to say, well, let's keep our hearing open and kick it back to planning board. But they might not, so they, they might make not. a decision yeah. and then we're just enforcing whatever they... And then it goes to full council, then the full council debates, <laughs> yeah. and then they decide what to do. Okay. Yeah. But we could always, I mean, if that were to happen and then a year from now we're like, oh, the criteria were wrong, we need to expand this to include other things that we yeah. want to consider that we could also go through this again and, and do that, right? So where that leaves us then. <laughs> so, well, so should we be making a recommendation to city council with revised language, you know, just I think you should take a vote six. To, to, you know, come together as a board to right. say how you, um, you know, and maybe not all of you agree, so that's fine. But if someone wants to uh, make a motion on this piece of it, um, you may want to, I guess the other part is side plan, so it's probably yeah. okay. Um, and you could m move that you're recommending that the language be changed to trigger special permit for this exemption and that um, the board criteria could consider changed. criteria that, yeah, that includes, um, in addition to net zero, it includes provision of whatever the threshold, 50% affordable housing and you know, um, open space protection or, um, and that that way it's not, um, it doesn't carve out other things that may come along, but those are sort of <coughs> narrowed <coughs> a bit. Mm -hmm. How do you folks feel about that? George, what are you thinking? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confused, to be quite honest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really confused. Um, an honest answer yeah yeah um because again we're talking about this one tree and this one tree is gonna <coughs> well, initiate, it could be 10, it could be right, 10 right. Right. but it's going to initiate a site plan review a special which, permit a special the, permit it's yeah. already so a more latitude permit, more latitude but another filing by the a different kind of filing by the applicant well, they would do it simultaneously. Uh -huh. So if yeah. they knew that going in that they had a bunch of trees, that they were going to create net zero building, for which they were going to create you know, 10,000 square feet of building rooftop solar, um, and they don't want to do the tree replacement, then they say, OK, I'm going to file for a special permit. So it's all time. about money. It's all about money, not doing the tree replacement, spending money. And that Mostly. was more or less triggered by affordable housing, not by our usual private entrepreneurs who are trying to do a development. Well, it's that's really, not true. I mean, yeah. smaller, like, so it, it would also be, you know, big developers who do this stuff all the time, and um, maybe it's not as big of a deal as some of the smaller developers who are doing one or two lots at a time. You know, that's that affects them more, I would say. Um, so it's not just, and, and to some degree it is about money, but it's also the argument that they are providing a benefit in creating net zero energy homes. And affordable housing. And or affordable housing, and, right. Okay. Um. So if, if taking it from their perspective, they feel like they've been penalized. You've heard this right. from Jonathan Wright. Right. right. He felt penalized in uh, on the Hinkley Street project because right. he had to do tree replacement, and yet he was providing these net zero homes. And he sh came and showed, just for information purposes, knowing that it, you know there was no relief that he could see, um, that there was a shadow line on the 
PV array on one of the roofs and he wanted to take that tree out but he had to do replacement. And so he presented information about how in his calculation he, you know, in the end, you know, um, his carbon impact would be X and, you know, planting new trees aren't going to provide this, you know. So he, so there are people like that too that feel like they are providing a benefit and yet they're being penalized. But the alternative at that same hearing, a lot of the neighbors were saying, we're being penalized because he's taking down these yeah, beautiful the trees. Yeah. And so there's that, so how do you weigh those two against each other? Right, I, I just, I was throwing it out there that just to say it's I, not, it's no, not all of, it's not just about money. Right. You know, it's just balancing So that would be our like benefits. extended special permit discussion would be like, <laughs> right. be like our 11 o'clock hearing. Right. <laughs> but, but aren't we also saying that if the applicant is willing to comes for a site plan review, he's willing to pay the extra money for the for the uh, tree replacement, but we're about now to say no, no, I'm sorry, it's a significant tree, so you can't even pay for replacement. No. Correct. No. No. That would still so the ordinance would still be in place saying that you have to either plant new trees to replace what you've cut that are significant trees of 20 inch DABH or greater. Um, you either plant according to the matrix, the calculation, the required calculation in the zoning, or you make a payment into the city's fund, tree fund. Um, that still stays. What this would do is add an exemption for having to do the replacement for certain conditions. So you're still, you know, if, and it doesn't get you out of all replacement, it would just be defined the way this is written to that area necessary to create PV access, solar access for buildings in order to create net zero energy. So you could clear this side of the site and then your building's over here and this clearing has nothing to do with the building. You don't even get to come and get the exemption from replacement for these. It's only about clearing for the purposes of creating that. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about now is instead of having that part of the site plan, elevate that exemption for that area up to special permit because that gives you is more it, is it still leverage. problematic to refer to it as an exemption like does that take away like again like sort of versus like a request for a waiver or like a request for relief of some kind like like i just feel like the exemption language like just pins us in like in the way that's like even if it's special permit like mm -hmm. then you have people who are like well your special permit says that your criteria is x and i met those criteria and you have to grant this like i think like we, it seems like most of us would be more more comfortable having more latitude, not framing it as an exemption okay. so much as so that permit though gives us a certain amount of latitude. Right, yeah. and I will say just back. I mean, I've been using the term exemption, but the top of the section says this requirements these requirements shall not apply to. Right. So the word exemption doesn't appear in there. If that's right. if it's you know, um, if that particular okay. phrase is or word is not I mean I don't think well like you. weird it's just yeah like this like I just keep hearing that word and thinking that somebody is gonna be like you know like expecting it you know that it's like versus shall not apply to applicants seeking a waiver through the special permit process like that seems more and you said something earlier about you referenced the 10,000 square feet of buildings again mm -hmm. so do you think that we need to keep that language in there or like well i mean i would recommend that you wouldn't allow for a greater than that i mean this is sort of opening the window the other thing is you could do this is this could be considered an incremental change right if you feel like this isn't expansive enough at some future date you could say twenty thousand square feet but this mm -hmm. is sort of sort of a starting point but i think you it should I think the language should be defined so it can't be someone coming in and just saying well my whole site is going to be a field a PV um, field mm -hmm. and I need to cut all these trees down so I'm providing five you know right. megawatts of solar therefore I should you should, should give me your my special permit right I still think it should be defined you know narrowly defined 
And so like the 50% affordable housing as opposed to 10% or something like that. Um, but that would is, we would add that to the special permit criteria. Well, that's, that's what I'm suggesting yeah, yeah. is anything, right. any Just be specific, and, right? Okay. So then six would be applicants seeking to construct buildings of up to 10,000 square feet and or install 10,000 square feet ground mounted PV seeking relief through the special permit, the planning board special permit process. Something like that. Yeah, we probably yeah, just be a special permit. For the planning board. Is the language here specific enough? to address the point that you were making a little while ago about the fact that it has to be trees that enable the net zero aspect of the building as opposed to just trees that are in the way. Because all it says to me is trees that are removed in order to create net zero energy buildings. So that's pretty broad and I'm not sure that that fully addresses that distinction that you're making between the trees on this side of the property and the trees that are actually shading the building. Um, so it was intended to be that so that language in order to create so you're removing trees to create net zero um i would interpret that and if it doesn't mean that to you then by all means <laughs> i mean it should mean that to most people okay. so if it doesn't then that would be a problem but also if it's part of special permit that's part of your discretion as well to say well wait a second <clears throat> You don't really need to cut all those down, yeah. but if you want to, you're going to replace them. Okay. So. Does the city currently have any other um, bonuses for applicants who provide net zero buildings? Do you get city doesn't give an individual incentive? Yeah, incentivize it somehow. Somehow. Because I, 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 I'm, I'm Cash thinking. Bonus. <laughs> yeah, cash bonus. It may come to that. That might be one of those radical things in a sustainability plan. But I'm thinking of it if uh, our friends up at the state hospital who did away with the fins on the windows, if yeah. that was part of their formula for the net zero, and now and they got the waiver of the trees, they got the exemption, and then all of a sudden they're building three years later. They didn't put up the PV array on the roof. They didn't do this or that, and. Um, again, it's probably a worst case scenario, but right now we don't monitor in any way a building's net zero ness, right? Well, this would require that. That's why the language about the building permit, that the building in the building permit, um, so. And it complies with, in accordance within one year yeah. of the issuance. Right. Okay. So when, when you pull a building permit, you have to show exactly what you're doing, and you, yeah. and you also have to meet the energy standards, so you have to show how you're meeting the energy standards. So if the permit issued says you get, you're getting waived from tree replacement for this section, then you, you know, your building permit has to show that you're doing that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just to play devil's advocate. Um, I know we've been talking about trees for an hour, but um, so the way this is written, we're talking about up to 10,000 square feet, okay. up to. So if I said uh, my mother is 75 and of ill health and I'm going to buy the property next to my house and build her a thousand square foot ranch, net zero building, but there's this big old oak tree that's going to prevent that and I want to chop it down so my poor old mom can live next to me in her waning years, we would say, no, you can't do that. You can't chop a tree down on your own property because there's no community benefit. There's no affordable housing. Tell your mom. But it doesn't meet sorry. the criteria that would result in us granting relief. Right. Well, I, I'll back up and say your, um, the house that you're going to build for your mother um, might not even trigger site plan because of a single family home. Um, so they may be able to. Uh, which case anyway. would cut down the. Right. Yeah. So there's no review of any. Yeah. So if I wanted to do an addition on my house and there was a 36 inch tree in the way of my addition, I can chop away and there's no review. I get my building permit. It's only when you need additional permit review that right. that would be triggered. Right, so we're, we don't have the, the authority to protect all significant trees in the city. We're only protecting trees right, that we which I wouldn't want, I wouldn't anyway. want yeah. to prevent a homeowner from, from doing what they want to do on their own property. Yeah. For the most part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So do we feel comfortable 
making a recommendation to city council that this language shift in such a way that it pushes this issue to special permit or requires that relief I, be granted yeah. during the special permit process in lieu of just a blanket exemption that's in the ordinance? I move to make the changes that Carolyn suggested about 20 minutes ago, <laughs> <laughs> um, which I know she's already written down, so I, I won't have to repeat those now. Is there a second? Yeah. Yuri, is a second? All those in favor? Those opposed? One. That was one of them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. yeah. Sorry. Still a There's just two. The second one is uh, clarifying the required site plan submission related to tree inventory, oh. landscaping, tree protection, and tree planting. This so one was just I one page. Yeah. yeah, this is the shorter change. So for the most part, these items are required now, but they're in 12.3. So a lot uh, of this is just bringing it because okay. when people are filing, they're sa they look at this and they say, what do I need to submit? So um, there's a landscaping section in the site plan submittal um, subsection of, of that, that. So this would add a bullet um, specifying, you know, yeah, don't forget, you have to do your inventory of significant trees over 20 inches. Um, and then, of course, if, um, and you have to identify the species size, health, long-term viability. The inventory of the trees on abutting properties if the drip line of, the, of these trees cross on the subject parcel that is new um, in the subdivision rules you've had previously you want to see I mean subdivision rules require that you see the trees on abutting properties um, that are um, next to this subdivision parcel mm -hmm. but it's not in site plan so um, this would be added um, and would that just be for our own edification like we don't yeah, so you'd be of tree protection, or other right? You want to be evaluating whether it makes sense to require tree protection. So then the landscaping plan should include um, more specific details about again how to protect them in accordance with this new tree planting guideline that the city has mm -hmm. uh, adopted. Um, and then the other item um, proposed to be added is that um, so that where trees um, the drip line of trees across the property those trees should be um, have protection zones marked out on the plan um, so it's clear for the contractor coming in um, and that uh, just clarifying what's required in 12.3 in terms of clearly tabulating the trees that are staying the trees that are being removed how big they are and what your replacement plan is mm -hmm. um, so this, the second to last bullet, again, is something because you're in site plan or sometimes special permit territory, the board can look at that. Typically for a development site, you know, there's, the applicant doesn't necessarily have to protect trees that are off site, but this is because it's in your jurisdiction, you can, this would be recommending that you add that into your review. It's second to the last bullet. Yeah. The, <clears throat> the last bullet when it references off-site tree replacement mm -hmm. so the applicant has no control over that either the applicant is paying into a fund which then funds off-site tree replacement so there is a provision as one of the mechanisms to meet your replacement criteria that you could plant in a place that the city has so you're providing the labor and the materials and you'll plant in the city right-of-way or somewhere else um, so that's another alternative um, that you can do. Does that happen? Uh, well, we haven't had. Do they do that? Um, yeah. So they're they're planting in the right of way in yeah. Florence. Uh, yes. So there's of right of way plantings. Okay. Okay. We haven't had too many because the ordinance isn't that old. So we're still yeah. going through development mm -hmm. projects. Even the um, the Bay State right on King Street aren't all their trees on the right of way? Right. That was typical site plan. That wasn't for oh. tree replacement. Um, I have a question. The second to last bullet. The, is the does the word saved like, w like can we commit to saving the tree or should it just be like protected or retained or something? Are we like setting ourselves up for making sure it like lives fruitfully for the rest of its 
you can't natural do life no no we can't yeah. right. that's what i mean so like i don't know like yeah the word there, saved i was well, like oh god are we really like what if we don't save the tree oh well i guess it's in they're intended to be saved as opposed to being removed. taken down and removed okay but if the lang if you have other language feel free to recommend changes I mean, to that yeah i mean i don't know if trees where trees are to be retained okay yep it means like god forbid like if they die like we would feel less guilty, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Just like that struck me as because I, I kill all my house plants, and so it just it's, it's like a very high bar. And <laughs> I do. Okay, so where trees are to be retained. Yeah. Okay. Any other concerns or questions or comments? Would we be ready to move to move to approve with that one adjustment? Let's second. George, second. So give it to George. Quick discussion. Oh, yes. So on the last hearing down on Olive Street, we had a big discussion about how we're providing protection to these trees. We use the word here protection zones, but the actual way that we protect trees is just in the guidelines, in the planting guidelines. All that this is talking about is an eight foot area or a fifteen foot area. <clears throat> so it should be referencing the, the same thing. So these are these are re referred to as tree protection zones. So wherever you're putting up, um, you know. Protection. So the guide the guidelines show graphically what the tree protection zone is. Right. So right. if you you need to establish your on the plan sheets, you need to graphically show where that zone is on the site. Okay. And once you've shown on the site plan where the zone is, then you have to conform to these protection guidelines. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Right. And that includes even neighbors' trees. Is that right? Well, so that their trip line is over. You if the right. this is what no. the site plan is saying, show that. So what, as part of your review, you would say, okay, if those are being, if you're intending those to be retained, you know, you want to make sure that construction vehicles aren't you know going into that area so yeah but I, including the neighbor's tree <clears throat> if the drip line it goes on to the applicants right that's what this language would right. say yeah okay thanks good mark made a motion would someone like to second it oh yeah second great all those in favor <laughs> yeah those opposed no opposed no can you say how great it was? Like everybody had like things to say about tree protection. <laughs> no, that was great. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. I'm uh, sure the city council listens to the yeah, entire whole thing. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Keep your eyes open. Yeah. 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 So we. You want to. Yes. I, yes. I think it's implied. It's my responsibility. I assume the motion to approve was a motion to close the public hearing and approve. Um, oh, we didn't close our public hearing. Yeah, so it would, right. It was. Yeah. Yes, right. That was to close and move. Thanks, Wayne. Right. Yeah. Yes, to close and move. It was implied. I'm, I, you didn't hear I said that. I was mumbling. <laughs> You're a mumbler, Sorry. Sam. <coughs> uh, update on scheduling, prioritizing planning projects and implementation, including resiliency plan, design with nature, form based coding, and sustainable Northampton. You have a presentation, Wayne? I do. How many slides is it? 25. <laughs> Maybe it's 24. So I, it's informal. Feel free to you know interrupt as we go through. So we have three big initiatives we're working on. You've all been invited to various public hearings. I just want to go through, for those of you who are newer in terms of sort of the framework, how that fits together, and just go through each of the areas so you all know what's coming. Because you'll be seeing a lot of these documents coming up in the near future. So. That's sort of the, the point. See, that was the first slide. That was easy. Um, so just sort of quickly, you know, the, the, the current comprehensive plan is just over 10 years old. It's 11 years old. Um, and I think you know this because you guys refer to the comprehensive plan a lot in your work. But a lot of stuff has come out of it. So I don't want you to think all the effort those of you who were on the board 11 years ago did was sort of wasted. It really sort of set the tone for a lot of things. You know, we we still go to council now and lots of orders that, that my office submits to council. The first paragraph is in accordance with sustainable Northampton plan explains why it's important or not important. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so you know in, in essence sort of the sustainability framework, you know, look at the, the graphic on the right. 
we've been tried to make sure that zoning and everything else we do is increasingly focused in all three of these areas. So you just had discussion tonight about, you know, equity in terms of affordable housing and how does that match the environment in terms of trees. You know, and so we tried to build those things in throughout the zoning and throughout the plan action. You're gonna see that more elsewhere. Obviously, where you guys on a day-to-day -day basis spend most of your time is reviewing permits, and so special permit and site plan approval. You know, we change those criteria out of sustainable Northampton. If you remember, one of the criteria in, in special permit is conformance to the comprehensive plan. I'm not sure that every developer pays attention, but the, the question somebody had about do we require net zero buildings elsewhere in zoning or encourage it, the answer is basically no, but it comes up occasionally. When you approved Florence Fields, we presented to you that part of the reason Florence Fields was conformance to the plan is we would put PV on the pavilion so the site would be net zero for electricity. So that it comes up from time to time. Um, we, you know, we have a full-time energy officer who's done a lot about reducing the city's environmental uh, energy footprint that came out of the comprehensive plan. Um, <clears throat> you know, lots of zoning updates that you're still dealing with on URB recently, the controversy that comes out of it, but all that stuff came out of the, the comprehensive plan. And then things that probably come to you less, but lots of public investments. We just spent a million and a half dollars in Pleasant Street, making it more of a complete street. We have, you know, a few million dollars in grants right now that we're administering, all of which came out of things that were discussed during the plan. So, you know, it, it has a long tail going forward. Um, the plan is now almost 11 years old. And so we're, in essence, a quarter of the way through revising the plan. So I just want to let you know sort of how the process started. Again, we've reminded you from time to time for those of you who have been here. But in 2014, we signed up for something called Star Communities, which is a program um, of assessing community sustainability. You don't know what LEED is for buildings. STAR was initially the equivalent of LEED for, building, for buildings, but it was for communities. And in fact, STAR just um, merged with LEED um, about a month ago. Um, and STAR is now a program within LEED, and as soon as we merge, they're LEED for communities. Um, and so we did that in 2014, and one of the, things we, the reasons we did it, I presented it to the, to the planning board at the time, was sort of think about what worked in the comprehensive plan and what didn't work. So we were looking for weak points in the plan so we could figure out what to do. And we, I think we concluded on three things were weak in the plan. The plan was great. It's made lots of changes. Um, but there were really three weak areas. One is the metrics in the plan, the, how we judge how good we're doing, wasn't particularly good. Um, and so we said we'd throw out all those metrics and we'd use STAR or LEED for cities as our replacement metrics. The second thing was the, the walking and bicycling focus was pretty weak. Uh, it had policies, but not more detailed. Uh, and so with your blessing, we commissioned the Walk Bike Northampton Plan in 2017. You adopted it as a, as a section of the comprehensive plan. It's our intention to bring it into the overall documents. So we don't have these two different documents. Um, and then the other major weakness was about climate resiliency and regeneration. Um, so that's the other big effort we're, we're working on right now is ways to, to fill those in. So those are all sort of the things that, that we agreed were weak. And then form-based code, which is the third initiative that we're working on now, um, is sort of a way to clean up the zoning code to ad address some of the things that, that the plan talks about in more detail. So I'm going to talk about those things in, briefly. So, you know, this, so, so you all know for STAR, we were like the top-ranked community in the country when we first are. We're now still one of four, um, there's now like 90 communities or so have been through the STAR process, and we're still one of the top four communities in the process. In Massachusetts? No, in the country. country. Wow. Who's above us? Uh, uh, Cambridge. <laughs> so within each category, you're not supposed to say who's above you, but Cambridge makes a big point that they have the top four points. So Cambridge, Baltimore, who's done a lot of work in social equity uh, and flood, flooding, uh, and Seattle uh, and Northampton, the four ones. Um, so we'll be coming back on the STAR communities in 2019. We're still debating. STAR gets retired at the end of 2019. So we're still debating do we renew as STAR or do we just jump right to lead for cities? Uh, I'm not sure, but, but you'll see that at some point. Um, but again, it's been useful because, you know, I talked this at a time when I presented, but what's great about being sort of this top-ranked community and getting, it's the equivalent of getting an A-minus, right? So we're doing really well and we're doing better than other communities. 
but in some ways it's actually made it easier to acknowledge our warts. So there's lots of things we don't do as good a job as we'd like. And so STAR sort of helped highlight those areas. They're literally like 400 uh, policies and programs that we look at as part of the STAR process. And so, you know, there's lots of things we can do, do a better job on. Uh, I say climate resiliency regeneration is probably the weakest one, uh, and then social equity is the weakest one everywhere. Um, we're actually better than many communities, but it's certainly weak for us. So again, walk by Northampton, I won't go through this. You, you approved this as you were on the planning board two years ago or a year ago approve the plan. It's still our blueprint for a lot of things we're doing. And again, we've already invested a couple million dollars based on recommendations in it. Um, we are in the middle of, of hiring a new engineer for redesigning all of Main Street. It's a $750,000 design project that will eventually result in a $10 million construction project that's consistent with Walk By uh, Northampton. We will, in, in probably July, hire an engineer for $100,000 to redesign streetscapes in Florence, also consistent. Are you gonna, I mean, the Valley Bike, I, I was just in, in San Francisco and everyone now has scooters. Are you gonna be going to scooters? So we're looking, we're probably not gonna bring them in, but you know, a lot of the scooters like, like Lime and Lyft are sort of coming on their own. Yeah. And so Carolyn's working on an ordinance that sort of regulates what are we willing to allow and what are we not willing to allow. Mm -hmm. I don't think we'd ban scooters, but we certainly don't want them left all over the sidewalks um, that many cities have them, and so we wanna figure out what the process is. We've been talking about how do we deal with other bike share, mm -hmm. so it's not our intention to prevent other bike shares if someone wanted to come. But Valley Bike, one of the big costs is we're committed to social equity, to putting them in places that serve lower income populations and unbanked populations. It seems fair if someone else comes, they should have to do the same thing. We're in earlier stages about the scooters. Got it. Um, scooter people have approached both Springfield and UMass, sort of exploring why they work there. They haven't approached us, but it's probably coming at some point. What, what's the short term feedback on the Valley Bike? Um, 50% incredibly success, 50% not so good. So um, we've had 80,000 miles ridden in, in four months, um, which is phenomenal, and so we're really good. pleased with that. <laughs> um, they seem to work when you go to the station, Lot, lots of great things. We have, um, we bought 500 bikes, and only 50% of them are out. We've had a big problem with maintenance. They, we always knew that we, they, some are always in the shop, right? So the original plan was 85% of the bikes would be out instead we have 45 to 50%. So that's a major problem. Are they um, brand new, Wayne? Yeah, there have been a few problems. One is, I moved down a picture, the, the, the thing where, where Dorothy's dog goes in the front of the bike, um, the basket. <laughs> um, apparently it's really attractive for 14 year old boys to sit in. And then it breaks. <laughs> um, and when it breaks, it rips out the frame and then the bike's not usable. Um, that's been the biggest problem. They also have had some problem with communications. Not in problems. Northampton. Not in Northampton. 14-year-old <laughs> boys outside of Northampton. <laughs> yeah, Springfield by far and UMass is somewhat doing it. I mean, in a way, it's kind of like a testament to, it means that like more people need access to this right. mobility. Right. Like, you know, right. if you're trying to fit two people on one bike, it's... Yeah, it just be for fun, though. But it also I mean, seems to be a cultural yeah, thing. It it so be yeah. Holyoke yeah. has at least as much poverty as Springfield. Yeah, it hasn't happened in Holyoke. Huh. It has happened in Springfield. So we think it's just a set of kids who think it's fun. Yeah, and, you know, and and those kids haven't come to Northampton or UMass or Holyoke. So yeah, I, yeah. we don't really know. So so we're working on that. Basically, you know, I guess the short answer is, if we say we're in the beta phase, we're incredibly happy. We thought we wouldn't be in the beta phase all year. You know, so we've withheld $250,000 from, um, it's a $1.1 $1 .1 million project, we've withheld $250,000 and they don't get that till they, till they finish these problems. So we're not worried about getting there, you know, it would be nice if it was a little bit sooner. What, what happens to the bikes during the winter? They get brought in December 1st to April 1st. Okay. They'd be brought in. So. Where, we're like, where's the shop? Where do they get brought in? So right now they have a shop in Florence in Eric Scherz building along the bike path. It's not big enough for all the bikes. They're looking for additional unheated warehouse. Mm -hmm. the, the shop will be open year round. That's why they catch up on the bike repairs. Um, I mean, the, the good news about the bike repairs, they're catching up, but it's slow. They told me they're now picking up about 10 bikes a day they're broken and putting 12 bikes a day they're out. That takes a long time at two bikes right. a day, right. mm -hmm. but they have the entire winter to catch up and figure out what the systems are. So they'll be looking for another warehouse for the winter as well, or truck bodies or something. But, um, so again, you know, all this is partially about 
this, as I say, is a freestanding plan now, but we want it to be a chapter in the comprehensive plan when we bring it in, so it's, it's all in one place. Um, open space plan has always been independent. You guys adopted it. Um, and again, it covers some of the things that we, some of these things we're bringing into the comprehensive plan. Um, uh, and it, uh, so then the, the big, so the two big things I want to talk about now going forward is the climate resilience and regeneration plan um, and the form-based code. That's where we're having a public hearing, so we want you to, to know what's going on. And ultimately, these are going to, both going to come to you for adoption. So the resilience and regeneration plan will be an element of the comprehensive plan. For the first year, it will be a freestanding element. That is, we're going to ask you to adopt it just the way you did for Walk Bike Northampton. And then we're going to mine it and merge it with sustainable Northampton. Um, one of the things we wanted deliberately is a comprehensive plan that can be a two or three year process and you sort of lose the community in that. So we wanted a distinct project that we can get people to understand, people can follow, and then it means that revising sustainable Northampton itself will be a much faster process. You may have heard me two years ago promise, or three years ago, promising we do the plan two years ago. Um, but we deliberately put it on hold for these other documents we think makes the process better. So just if you follow the jargon, you're going to hear people talk about climate adaptation, adapting to change. We've deliberately used the term resiliency for two reasons. One, it's a broader term. It's not just adopting to climate change, but it's also thinking about how do we thrive. And, you know, so it's not we're going to live with climate change. We want to actually thrive with climate change, right? Celebrating water, like the, the water course that goes through Pulaski Park is a perfect example. We're not just treating stormwater from the street, we're making stormwater into a resource that people love in the park. Um, and, and regeneration, similarly, you know, if the, the term of, of art is mitigation, which is reducing your carbon footprint, we don't want to just mitigate, we want to regenerate, we're going to restore things, invasive plants, those kinds of things. Um, but the other reason we're using these terms is for the sake of this plan, it's about climate resiliency and climate regeneration. But when we get back to sustainable Northampton, those terms mean something in non-climate phases. So thinking about resiliency to economic downturns, thinking about regeneration to environmental degradation are important. So we deliberately chose the terms here so they become a theme when we come back for the plan. Um, so some of you have seen these slides. I'm not going to, I'm just going to race to these. They're our consultants from it. But again, resiliency is thriving with climate change, and this is both about chronic and acute shocks. So chronic is things like, you know, long-term droughts, more rainstorms. Um, acute is, you know, one big thunderstorm that comes through that the pumps fail at the sewage treatment plant and downtown is under two feet of water. How do we deal with those things? And then regeneration, I say, is sort of the, you know, the climate mitigation, those kind of things. So, this is, I'm not going to go through these all, you probably can't read this slide anyway, but these are all the areas we looked at for STAR, and we want to think about all these areas as part of resilience and regeneration. We're, we're really trying to make sure it's not a box. So, you know, clearly for climate change, bigger storms is the biggest thing Northampton has to deal with, right? Sea level rise is not going to get us. Probably drought, for the most part, isn't going to get us. Um, Bigger storms, more frequent storms is the, is the big thing. But these things cut in all areas. So, you know, we were talking about affordable housing before. You know, one of our biggest concerns is we've done, made enormous strides in getting to net zero buildings and getting to more energy efficient buildings, basically for people who are building new homes, which is middle class and upper middle class populations. So as we think about climate change and think about hotter summers and people needing more air conditioning, we need to think about, okay, how does that deal with people who don't have energy? So we're just trying to look at, at all those things that are there. Um, these are sort of the guiding principles that we've, we've talked about. So resiliency, we've already talked about, regeneration we've talked about. Again, the economic and cultural vitality. This is, you know, again, thriving a lot of these things. How do we take advantage of this? So we're beginning a study process with Amherst and Pelham about some called community choice electric aggregation. This is that right now, if you don't choose a different provider, National Grid is your, your energy provider. We're looking at Northampton being your default provider. You can always opt out, um, but we'd be the default provider. And one of the things we want to do is how do we get uh, what's called distributed energy resources? So how do we get as you know, a lot of places that go to net zero energy do so by buying renewable energy credits in Montana. It sounds great. We're all renewable. But buying renewable energy credits in Montana doesn't, because they're cheap. 
they're really inexpensive. Doesn't really help our local economy. We'd rather do more to get PV in Northampton, to get batteries in Northampton, to do those kinds of things. Wait, I have a dumb question. Yeah. What is that icon for economic and cultural vitality? I was wondering. What is saying a bucket or something? Like what? Yeah. What is that? It's like your dead house plan. It's like my dead It's, it's, it's a little triggery for me, yeah. I mean, I have no idea. Sorry. I was thinking it was more like a bowl, like an amaryllis or something, something that's going oh, it's so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll go with that. That's good. Um, so, equity, we just talked about. And then the regional co cooperation. This week, we, we've you know, grapple with uh, what are the things that make sense to be locally, right? So, Carol and I get paid by Northampton, our resources are in Northampton, but we think of what are the things that work better for us regionally. So Northampton, for example, is the lead community for Valley Bike. Valley Bikes were there for a lot of reasons, but one is about greenhouse gas emissions. And it was something that made more sense from a regional perspective than for Northampton to work by itself. We just closed out a $2 million grant we had that's about looking at the overlap of health and the built environment. And again, we were the lead community for 15 towns. So we're trying to figure out what's the sweet spot? Where should we be working with Amherst and Springfield, and where should we not be working with them? Um, well, into that. Wayne, real quickly, you mentioned this thing about an electric um, power collaborative with Amherst and Pelham, so not on the lines of like Holyoke Electric or South Hadley Electric. It's a much correct, right? So you know, we have a dere Massachusetts deregulated energy twenty years ago. So it used to be that utilities own the power generation; they were required to di divest from that. So National Grid, all they own is distribution, but then they buy power from other people. So you can open, you can have a PV generation and sell to National Grid, or you can have a nuclear plant and sell to National Grid. National Grid may sign a 20-year agreement to buy, but they don't actually own equity in it. And, and the reason for that was to allow competition. Mm -hmm. So National Grid's the default, but you can choose any supplier you want. Most large providers have already opted out. Northampton. City does not buy from National Grid. We get a transmission from National Grid, but we buy from other people. Most small providers, single family homes, you know, small businesses do buy from National Grid for doing it. And so that's the position. It's an opt out. So, so if we form this, this community choice aggregation, we would be the default provider. You could always opt out of us. You could go back to National Grid. You could go to uh, Hampshire Council of Governments. You go whoever you wanted, but we'd be the default. Um, Part of the reason we want to do it is because we can have this more of this focus on distributed energy. And qu part, quite frankly, is there are a lot of ripoff companies. Those people you get 12 letters a day from, yeah. okay. a lot of those are not real. I mean, yeah. they, they're real in the sense they're saying it's renewable energy, but they're the ones who are buying wrecks yeah. from Montana and aren't really doing yeah. green energy or doing the things they claim mm -hmm. they're doing. Um, this is whole um, weird process of where cities actually who are saying they're 100% renewable sell their rates. So you get, when you generate renewable energy, you get RECs. That used to be uh, SRECs, so Solar Renewable Energy Credits. Now it's a smart program. And you sell those. And every community needs to sell those to make the, them pay for themselves. But to claim your renewable energy, you can't sell your RECs. So this is a whole arbitrage where communities put PV in, they sell their RECs, and then they buy Montana RECs. Boston does this. Um, they sell their RECs at you know, three or four cents a kilowatt, and they are, and then they buy them from Montana one. So we're trying to do something that's more honest that really serves the lower county. Um, all right. So ignore the thing on the right. This is from the, the public hearing, but just we had a bunch of steps in this process. Partially because of a bunch of different grants, but we got a grant from the state for four hundred thousand dollars to look at stormwater um, and look at more green solutions. And so we're looking at ten test sites in the city. We. It's amazing how far $400,000 doesn't go. But all we're doing is looking at four sites, figuring out what we can do in those sites. Some of those were choose for design, and we're chasing money for those things. But they're models. I mentioned the, you know, the rain garden through Pulaski Park. That's great to look at. It doesn't add up to any significant amount of water. We're looking at you know, how do we scale those up a little bit. Um, you all know that literally the back of this parking lot right here would be in the floodplain of the Connecticut River, but for the dikes around downtown. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, we think about can we get less water to come to downtown in case the dikes ever fail in a big storm or the pumps downtown fail. So that's, that's a small piece. That's more freestanding and probably has less to do with the planning board. Um, and then the bigger part, the climate resilience and regeneration process, we've had a series of focus groups, a series of public hearings. December 11th is the next one. 
you're so much, we're, we're send you invites to it, but there's a, a focus group in the afternoon for those who've been invited to our previous focus groups, and then a public forum uh, late or early evening. Um, and so, but at some point, this will come back to you guys to look at the plan, make comments. At some point, you do a formal public hearing, and we're going to ask you to adopt the plan. So we obviously, as it gets further along, want to come back to you uh, and to get input. Um, the mayor committed that just a week ago. Um, so we had, he had committed, I think it was less than a year ago, that the city would uh, had a goal of 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And just a week ago, we changed that to be carbon neutral by 2050. Um, and so we're taking this plan very seriously on what are all the things it takes to be carbon neutral. Um, that's part of this conversation you heard tonight about how do we encourage net zero buildings. We're going to come back with other zoning and other things in, in the coming months moving forward on that. Um, we're also really committed. You see some communities who say we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050. We're not going to do much to 2049, and I'm sure in the last six months we're going to solve it. So we're trying to sort of do a, a real plan on things so that we can actually accomplish. Some things obviously like you know, the, the uh, cafe standards, the mileage standards for cars, we don't control that. So we have to say we're going to be carbon neutral, assuming other people do their share. There are only some things that we can control, but at least for the things that we control. So um, in this process, we identified the biggest risks from, from climate change. Um, we talked about flooding, extreme weather, drought, increased temperatures. Um, and then indirectly, you don't really see this on here, but the biggest risk for increased, te two biggest risks for increased temperatures, one is obviously heat wave and people dying from heat waves, particularly elderly and, and, and people who are sick, but also disease vectors, you know, so ticks and, and mosquitoes that didn't survive here 10 years ago, you know, we, we've had one trap in Northampton, so not a lot, that caught the mosquito that could, in theory, carry Zika. Right. So there's no Zika here. There are only a couple traps, but 10 years ago, we never would have caught them. They're, they're only in tires because tires insulate the water. But, you know, we're seeing these trends going on out here. And so that, that becomes part of what we're focusing on. I'm just going to race through this. But again, we're going to see, we expect some increase in rainfall. Frankly, it's not that significant. That's not really something we worry about. So the chart on the left is, yeah, some more water. It's the one on the right that's more important is those big storms. The storms that are not necessarily devastating, you know, this isn't Hurricane Sandy. It's the storms that maybe overtop, you know, Church Street or overtop um, uh, Old Ferry Road. You know, the, the ones that once a year you see the flood and causes problem and causes the city a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in erosion damage. If instead of getting those once a year, which we have built into our program forever, we get them six times a year, that starts being significant. And that, that's the thing that's actually more likely to happen out here. Um, we want, this is obviously the big role for you all, is we wanted, this is the thriving part, right? So the values we have as a community should be reflecting resiliency. Resiliency shouldn't suddenly be we throw everything out. So, you had a great conversation about trees, right? So I think we should be moving really aggressively towards net zero buildings, but in balance with the value of trees, in balance with the value of affordable housing, all those other things that you talked about I think are adequate. So that's part of the conversation we're trying to do, is, and that's why this resiliency plan needs to come into our comprehensive plan so it has a home with all the other stuff that, that you do. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but we're trying to really figure out you know, there's lots of stuff that are feel-good things. You know, whenever we hold community meetings, the first thing that people talk about is recycling more. I love recycling. I think it's really important. But it is about smaller than 1% of our greenhouse gas emissions. If we threw out every piece of plastic bag we have, assuming it didn't go washed into streams, it's not really going to have a significant impact on greenhouse gases, as opposed to lots of other things we do that have, have greater impacts. And so we're just trying to be grounded. So this one's about... Um, you know, generally, who's using power? You can guess. So you can see waste is small, and this waste incidentally includes the sewage treatment plant. Um, but transportation systems, which are both the actual transportation systems, so how do we reduce carbon emissions for transportation systems, but also how do we avoid people needing to travel in the first place? You know, if you live in a walking distance a downtown, you don't have to get in the car. Um, and then stationary sources, basically buildings. Um, Likewise, this is probably more in the weeds, but looking at the different fuel types, one of the things that right now in Massachusetts, 13% of our um, electric source is renewable, is from renewable energy. 
um, which isn't a huge amount, but at least it's 13 percent, as opposed to most of us heat our house with fossil fuels that are 0 percent renewable. And the electric grid could, in theory, be 100 percent someday. Natural gas is never going to be 100 percent. Even in spite of ExxonMobil's ads, natural gas is not going to be 100 percent. And so we sort of have strategies of renewable energy. How do we get to renewable energy? How do we do conservation first, right? The, the, the best fuel is the ones you don't have to burn in the first place. And then how do we electrify things? So electri electrifying thermal loads and electrifying transportation, because that's a system that can be, re can be renewable. Uh, again, sorry, sorry, back one slide. Yeah. <laughs> Down at the very bottom, buildings PV ready. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, photovoltaic, revisit utility scale solar PV. So the twin of what you discussed today was thinking about utility scale PV. Yeah. So we first adopted an ordinance. You're going to hear this in much more detail later. But we first adopted an ordinance to allow utility scale PV. We said it couldn't be on sites that we had to cut down more than 25,000 board feet of timber. And, the re and there are two reasons for that. One is wooded areas are often the most sensitive ecologically. Um, and the second was all those trees have carbon sequestered in the tree cutting down the tree. I mean, you had exactly this conversation today. Mm -hmm. So we sort of said, well, let's start with that. We're now working on, is there a way to get more refined? So, so one of you said this in today's conversation, but can we figure out exactly how much carbon is sequestered in a tree, or roughly? I mean, it's going to depend on the species. And how long would it take PV panels to generate that much and do sort of a better balance? Maybe it's OK to cut down more trees. Um, this has come up. You all approved the one Sincarpa on yeah. uh, Park Hill Road. There's another one we thought was about to come before you at um, uh, the old gravel pit, the, the Bill Willard pit, mm -hmm. which to us seemed like a perfect site, but it turns out there's 104,000 um, board feet of, of trees there, mm -hmm. which would mean it wouldn't be allowed now. Um, they can always, just as you heard of Carolyn talk about the loopholes, you could always cut down the trees, wait two years, and then come in. Um, and so we want to be more thoughtful. Instead of sort of building these loopholes, what's the right balance for it? Um, so I, I, I talked about those recs. Maybe part of the right balance is they give us some of the recs to read. So we're sort of playing with different things, but that will come before you in the process. Um, again, trying. And this data is not great. Well, we, we sort of didn't do a detailed greenhouse gas emissions because we knew the data was horrible until we talked to every other community all of whom talk about their greenhouse gas emissions, turn out everyone's data is horrible. Unless you have a municipal power plant and you really know what you're doing, a lot of these are models. So the one about cars, for example, we have a few traffic counters in town, so we know how many cars there are in certain points. PVPC is translated into models for how many cars we expect everywhere, and then there's models of how much fuel they're generating. So it's a lot of steps out, but that's what everyone's doing, and so it's useful data to compare to other towns, and basically it's what's out there. Um, but it's still really useful. We, we just got from Department of Transportation um, the car registration for every single vehicle in the city. Um, and it's confidential data, so we're not going to release the data we have. But we are going to go through and go through the data and figure out who has, you know, there's one Hummer in all of Northampton. There's 83 Priuses. Um, I, someone, when I told that, somebody said, no, there must be 2,000 Priuses. I can't yeah, really. <laughs> and we're going to map which neighborhoods are there. Yeah, and that will help us sort of tell the story, right? We know that some things are contagious. You put a PV panel in your, in your house, your neighbors are more likely to put a PV panel. We think that's true for cars. We think about where do we put electric charging stations. So, but, but this data sort of helps us figure out what are things, you know, livestock is a huge factor if you're doing greenhouse gas emission reduction in Montana. It's not a very big factor in Northampton. So we're not going to spend any time on livestock reduction. Um, whereas, you know, commercial buildings, it's like commercial buildings include residential above a certain size. This is the way that the power company um, codes it. So that green that looks as residential is actually a much bigger number if you include a lot of the blue there. But it, it helps us refine our efforts so we can really focus on what it is. So for example, Cambridge has a benchmarking ordinance. Big buildings, they want to know how much power they use. Um, and at certain points, like when the buildings transfer hands, they want the buildings to be cleaned up. Um, Indianapolis, actually, oddly enough, has done a lot of work on energy disclosure for rentals, because Indianapolis has a huge rental market for students. students Go, they rent a place based on the rent that's there, 
and they don't understand that one place they're going to pay twice as much a heating bill as another place. And so Indianapolis done a work, a lot of work on disclosure. Those could be great policies we do. They're both going to frankly be really controversial, right? Landlords aren't going to love an energy disclosure ordinance. If it makes a huge difference, that might be something worth pursuing. We're not going to fight a battle and tilt at windmills for something that's no significant impact. So this data sort of lets us be more informed in a way we haven't been before for all the flaws in the data that's out here. Um, all right, so that sorry. So that's sort of it for this piece. Again, you know, come December 11th, we're, and now we'll sort of, starting December 11th, we expect to spend more time before you and start getting deeper in the weeds and what we're trying to actually do. Can I just also add on this slide, so uh, as it relates to commercial buildings, one of the things that was on one of the previous slides was site plan approval criteria say that buildings need to show that they're PV ready, right, mm -hmm. that they can install. Not that they have to, but they're, um, built their they're being structured in a way right. to do that mm -hmm. there was some controversy as it went through city council about that ordinance why how are you why are you going to make you know building a property developers do this mm -hmm. but you know ever so there may be other ordinances like that um that are proposed where you know the idea is to really cut away at that high percentage of um emissions coming from those commercial buildings, again, includes multifamily buildings as well. I, I think the thing we found most disappointing when we did a general public workshop um, is the number of people who said, oh, the solution to all this is renewable energy. And in some ways, that's, that's the last solution we want to get to. So getting conservation in buildings is cheaper you know, for everybody and retains more money locally than renewable energy, getting people to drive less or have alternatives is better. So renewable energy is, again, part of that trilogy, but only part of it. And so, again, we use this. Flawed as the data is. So we're going to try to give those priorities to you as we go forward, knowing the data is always going to be imperfect in the process. Um, um, okay. So then the other one to talk about is just this form-based code. Again, so I've seen some of you at the, the public forums. We're doing two efforts, one in downtown Northampton, the Central Business District, one in Florence, and what's currently one of our many general business districts. But we're assuming at the end of the day that at some point, Florence will have a different signature zoning than other general business districts. Right? Florence has the same zoning as, as Damon Road. Um, it has different opportunities, different challenges, so it makes sense to be its own. Um, and so, so there's a study, where we, again, we've hired a consultant for this process as well. I, I'm not going to go this in detail. Um, this slides are really for background, not to spend a lot of time on. But there's, there's sort of a few things we want in a form-based code. Maybe three important messages. One is just making this them more more graphic, just so people understand the zoning more. People shouldn't have to hire a lawyer or consultant to understand the zoning. The second is, frankly, in looking at our zoning carefully in a graphic way, we think we're going to discover things that we haven't focused on in the past. It just lets us to go back and think about what are the holes in the system. Um, and the third is, you know, we spent a lot of effort on design standards. So Carolyn keeps telling me I, I undercut the time, but 20 years ago, we did a detailed plan with Florence, and it was really clear at the time that Florence didn't want design standards. Since then, people complain about the um, uh, um, Cumberland Farms building or the building on the corner of Maine and, and Sa uh, um, South Maple, um, or the birthing clinic coming forward. Again, you guys proved exactly how to approve it, but it seems like times have changed, that more people want to have some kind of design standards. Likewise, in downtown, we have the Central Business Architecture District, but since we formed that district, downtown is two or three times the size it used to be. And the standards that made sense in the old brick buildings in downtown, still makes sense to me, the old brick buildings, maybe aren't the best standard for a new building that's built on the south side of the roundhouse or a building that's built on the lower part of Pleasant Street or a building that's built on Hawley Street. Um, and, you know, we've tried to consolidate permits so you know most people who come before you don't have to always come before the, the zoning board and vice versa. Occasionally someone hits both. It used to be that wasn't true, that 10 years ago you might need a permit from, from both boards. We want to sort of think a little more about what makes sense to come before both you and Central Business Architecture. Mm -hmm. So again, from my standpoint, if it's a brand new building at the Fitzwillies parking lot, that's probably going to come before both of you. But I'm not sure that other ones have to. But the whole conversation you had before of we want to have less discretion, more measurable standards, 
form-based code can hopefully get us to do that. So what, you know, there's a whole controversy about the lumber yard, what exactly fit in the neighbor and what didn't, because <coughs> we didn't really have a detailed standard. Um, we have, frankly, better standards already than most communities, but not as good as we can get, so can form-based code let us do some of those things? So everything from Cumberland Parmas and Florence to the lumber yard. So that, that's really what this process is. Um, we also realize as <coughs> part of reopening them up, that sometimes the, the standards we have now for central business architecture work really well because we have professional designers on the board, but they might not work so well to, to let an applicant know exactly what's expected of them. And so we sort of want to spend the effort to say, here's what we want. So one example that has come before you, not often, but occasionally, is we like buildings downtown to be built up to the sidewalk. It frames the street you can issue a special permit to allow buildings to be set further back. So for example, the Chamber of Commerce building, when they did some work on that, they came before you and said, we're gonna have a plaza in front of the building. Can we still keep the building set further back? Can we not meet the minimum height requirement? And you guys approved it. But you could imagine a standard that says, we expect buildings to be within five feet of the sidewalk, unless you build a plaza that pedestrians are welcome on in front of your building. In which case, you don't need to come before the board. We can just approve it. So it's, it's that kind of thing we want to think about the, those conversations. But uh, so again, that fits in here. The other thing we we haven't really done before, and I think this really struck Callan and I when you approve the Shaw's Motel, mm -hmm. is for a number of years we've told people if you're doing a new building, you have to basically rebuild the city's infrastructure up to the curb line, redo sidewalks, redo street trees, do drainage. Um, and we have our subdivision standards, so we have a clear standard what we expect people to build to. But the subdivision standards assume a much wider right of way than exists. So in front of Shaw's Motel, if you put a six foot wide sidewalk and a 10 foot wide tree belt and some low impact drainage, it would work perfectly, that's the subdivision regs call for. But you don't have that real estate. And we don't really have a process to advise you, which is more important, sidewalks or, or street trees or something different. And so we wanted that conversation. So you, here you can see a perfect example, right? So in residential neighborhoods, we have tree belts that often thrive with trees and vegetation. Downtown, where it's too urban and too much foot traffic, we have individual tree planters. Um, and those trees die every 20 years. We don't really have a great standard for those trees. Somewhere in between, this isn't a great picture, but the perfect example is in the way of the post office. We have basically a mud strip, right? It's not like downtown. It's not concrete to the street with tree planters, but it's not like the neighborhoods because nothing's going to survive in that grass strip because everyone parks their car and then they get out and walk across it. And so it's that kind of thing to help us think more about these things. Um, the central business district may grow, but it may actually be divided into smaller areas. So the standards for Main Street maybe aren't the same as standards for you know, um, Center Street. They might be exactly the same in terms of uses in most things, but like for example, on Main Street, we a year ago we had four curb cuts. Curb cuts don't make a lot of sense on Main Street. We closed one of them. The owner of Fitzwillies was so excited about our closing the curb that now he wants to close his curb. Um, I don't think we should have any curbs on Main Street, but of course you can have curbs in every other street downtown. Um, and, and so there may be <coughs> subtle differences that form-based code can work on. You know, that the buildings may be exactly the same, but you know, the street layouts may be different. Um, Main Street varies dramatically in width. So the same standards, you know, the parking, sidewalks really wide in front of CVS and relatively narrow across from City Hall. So we want to think about those different standards for doing these things. What this also does, so that this is mostly what the standards would be when someone comes before you for a new building. And we don't get a lot of new buildings, but you know, once a year on the average, you get a building downtown. Um, but also, as I say, we're just kicking off this $750,000 design process to rethink all of Main Street. And we will be kicking off a $100,000 design process to think about Main Street in Florence. So this programmatic stuff that right now is in zoning, or it would be in zoning, will help inform that process so we get some, some consistency in the process. Um, <clears throat> again, I'm with this, but you know, sort of thinking exactly what do we want where. Um, you know, we had a whole discussion about where do sidewalk cafes work and how do we get more sidewalk cafes and, and those <clears throat> kinds of things in the process. So, all right, that's what I have. Wayne, that whole, those last six slides are a huge departure from the text-based oh, yeah. zoning guidelines. Mm -hmm. 
Have you been doing that in house, or do you have a? No, we hired out. So Peter yeah. Flinker for Dodson and Flinker. Oh, okay. Uh, at Florence. So in order to do this, you would continue to hire out to provide drafts and. Yeah. yeah. So remember, I mentioned that we just completed a two million dollar public health grant. We did a regional grant. So that's actually what funded the work on the streets. The idea of saying is, how do we get people to walk more? We have to make, which you know, high diabetes, high obesity, high heart attacks, and so that funded the first phase. We thought we were going to finish that phase and come back before you and just code the public realm. And then we got another large grant from the state, um, and we, just, we hired them again for the second contract to continue on to the private realm through we do it all t together. No. Carol and I know lots of things, but graphics are not our strength. <laughs> <laughs> we're just really grateful you got the minutes done. Thank you. George, you've been bugging me about those minutes. <laughs> So what's the, I guess what would be useful for us is, well, first, if you have any thoughts offhand, but also, what's the best way to get you all involved? Should we just invite you to these other forums and then bring a finished plan here? Do you want to do working sessions? Do you want to do subcommittee? We're, we're open to any it's way you guys want to get involved. Ten years ago for a sustainable plan, we did, did, weren't there more working sessions? Right. Yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, that's all I had to go by, but that seemed productive. Can you describe what that is? It sounds f fairly obvious, but um, how would that differ from what we're normally doing? Well, it would just be so we'd set aside a date like tonight, no permits, and just go through. And but we do it more regularly, so right. not once a year. It would be, you know, I don't know, once a quarter or something like that okay. to work on. It would just be like more in depth. Yeah. This discussion, like we'd hang on this slide for an hour and just go over everything. And then tweak the wording, and then they go back and clean it up, bring it back to us, and then once we are comfortable, then we would recommend mm -hmm. to have others look at it. Thank you. There is some merit to those to us participating in those large community discussions, though. I know it's a, it's an extra time for us, but I know when I was up at the Florence one, there was some really interesting feedback that not people didn't say publicly, but they said on the side as they were doing these interactive things. So I think for me, it was good to get grounded in kind of what yeah. a lot of folks are thinking about these things. Yeah. And they're not, and I'm no expert on form-based zoning and neither are folks in the community, but it's kind of what they see and what they want for that. And I think some of those working sessions, we had people, um, like there were certain aspects of it, um, you know, central business or something that were, there was back and forth with mm -hmm. the public. It was an open conversation and it was, it was pretty dry going over this, but, but, it, but it touched a nerve with, with whoever. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't a, a forum outside of here, but there was that give and take. So those working sessions would be, they're, they're open to the public, they would be. Yeah, I mean, like, oh, you're yeah. gonna be like this, yeah. No, that's great. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, all of the public forums have been on dates when I'm out of town. And so I've been like, I really would love to be able to come to them, but every single one <laughs> yeah. is, yeah, is like a date when I'm in Cambridge. And so enjoying Cambridge's, you know, star <laughs> city <laughs> status yeah, of yeah. riding public bikes <laughs> and such. But uh, so yes, working sessions would be fantastic. Uh, yeah, that would be great. And which is best, sort of having an evening you can put aside for it or carving out 45 minutes at a normal meeting? What, what works? I was going to go the other way. I know. I was going to go the other way and say, because at normal meetings, it's so hard to yeah. know. Because even like tonight, you, like, you looked we at our agenda we were and do trees. That's a 10 minute conversation. Right. It's an hour conversation. <laughs> yeah. We could and just tell the people that it's, you know, stop now. Yeah. We're talking yeah. about I think before, because it was like mapped out, we're, we're going to, like Carolyn said, we, we've got five meetings over the course of the next six months. Right. And we're just going to march through this, and so it, it's it's structured. I think that would, I mean, that's what I'd prefer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it was nice that Mark and I were there during that time of sustainability plan, because then you feel like you're really kind of doing this planning that's going to impact mm -hmm. the future, whereas as opposed to just reviewing yeah, sites and yeah. doing right. that kind of mundane yeah. stuff, it's really kind of a nice role for the planning yeah. board. I have a very, like, sort of weird like modern picky questions so if we're if we do working sessions here is there any um ability for us to also like have like you know 
like a Google Drive, you know, like sheets or like, is there anything that we can do outside of the meetings together without like bumping up against like uh, to staff, stuff, yes, or? to each other, no. Okay. So you can send email, or Google documents, whatever to us, but as soon as you see what the other people are saying, right. that becomes a tool. So we can't use like a Google Doc for like collaboration among right. us right. outside of the meetings. Okay. Bummer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just it's 2018, like, yeah. you know, yeah, it would yeah. just be great. Like, <laughs> but, yes. okay. Other, if you were in another community, you might be able to do that. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. Noted. <laughs> so, yes. So, I mean, how do other folks feel? Are there, is anybody yeah. dramatically opposed to the idea of working sessions? Nope. Great. I'm not dramatically opposed, but I have to confession. Uh, I'm impressed that people are so enthused about these working sessions. <laughs> uh, to me, um, it does not sound exciting to be <laughs> crafting language to be used in five years for different provisions of the zoning ordinance or layout of sidewalks in Florence or whatever the issue may be. This is what makes the world go round, Alan. I know it. it it's one. <laughs> I'm only <laughs> confessing. <laughs> it was encouraging. When, when, when we did the working sessions and then they turned into an actual plan and then six months later an applicant came in front of us and their their permit was in part referencing what we, it took us two years to go through. That was at least fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Might have been not, you know, as exciting as it was, but it was, <laughs> it was encouraging to see that, and this is, the, this is a continuation of that. Yeah, even stuff like the birthing center, like we had conversation about that. Like, it'd be so interesting to like do this work and then see a, a different project come before us because we did that work. Like, yeah. that would be great. Right. And, Nice. What I think is cool is because we are mainstreaming resilience and planning. Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. whole thing that for me has a value. And on these sessions, you are forming that kind of agenda of bringing the ideas and we as a more planners or sustainability you can uh, uh, integrate more, not just in terms for you, but in our own discussion. Mm -hmm. And when we assess any, you know, the, 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 the project, projects that come here, I think, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and that was a, oh, climate change is my thing, right? That's just put it this way. Because you love it? No, because that's my PhD. <laughs> 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 so. You hate it. <laughs> so, uh, because uh, I, I'm curious, um, how you, is a strategic action plan, how does that, if you have any strategy, how to mainstream this with, you know, it's funny. Finances and kind of stuff. How, how do you? I'll just preface by saying this is a t total ego trip. But so UMass planning program goes through this accreditation process, and they just had a team of accreditors in here. And I, I spent the morning for some of the meetings, and the leader of the team teaches at, uh, at University of Pennsylvania, and he said, "Oh, I love the Northampton Sustainable Plan. Lots of communities talk about sustainability." I don't know if he was just pulling my leg, but he seemed to know about it. He claimed he used no. it for teaching. Um, but you guys incorporate it in, in what you're doing. And so, I, I, you know, I think it's the incorporating these things in everything that, that we do and how make it, it all talks to each other. So the, you know, the Valley Bike is not just about transportation choices, but about greenhouse gas emission reduction. I, I think, think that's a good role. thing to do because uh, I, a while ago, I was a part of the Sustainable City Task mm -hmm. Force of Santa Monica. And soon after, they came out with a Santa Monica strategic plan. And basically, what did they do? All this strategy, they were kind of a mainstreaming with the planning. So instead of have two strategies or two, you just integrating them. And that's why I think uh, when I saw this, I thought, oh, that's pretty good. Um, and I'm looking forward. To it, you know? sure. and it, I think it's very important for us to learn about this because. As he says in the beginning, we're talking about the trees, right? Yeah. And uh, that's, that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. right. And he was watching us discussing that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my point is that that's a kind of a mainstream integrating and how you develop common ground in this whole thing.
we need to take a vote for you? Yeah. <laughs> you have some kind of vague timeline when you're hoping this form base? Well, so the climate resiliency is actually a higher priority because we can't, we're both because the, the grant runs out and because we can't go to the next stage of planning. So that's supposed to be done in March. Um, you know, we still get the original files in Adobe Illustrator. So even when the consultant's done, we can, you don't have to, I mean, we don't really feel pressure to adopt it. So the consultant would deliver it, the plan to us, we give them as much feedback as possible, and then we're on the files and we can keep, continue making changes. But it's gonna move pretty fast. Form-based code, it's, on a, it's, it's supposed to be done by the end of June. Again, we're on the files after that. So that's the time period. I think, you know, totally up to you in terms of the working sessions versus separate time. I think in terms of you, it's really gonna be when can Carolyn carve out a meeting for us to meet with you guys, you know, and, and that's always the challenge. Just have a moratorium on development. Okay. Yeah. Here, <laughs> no permits. <laughs> that was raised a while ago. <laughs> just joking, I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. Or there's always a third Thursday of the month for folks to come together. But that folks wouldn't jump at that. Yep. Sometimes there's a slowdown at the beginning of the year, so the first part of the year. So we can just start. Um, I can start looking ahead at seeing what January, February looks like for the next meeting, because December's out. Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. We have some A Rs. We don't have any. Yes. We have some minutes. Yes, we have minutes. Yeah, I approve the minutes. Oh, minutes. Everybody read the minutes? the minutes. One of them, one of them approve, also had like approve, a lot approve, of. Like, of course I read them. But, um, I don't did anybody else notice that? What's one that? Of one of the minutes had like a bunch of like, sort of like notes stuff that wasn't like full sentences or anything. Oh really? Yeah. That's bad. Sorry. Oh, no, tell me which one. I'll just go. Fix oh, it. I mean, I don't know one of them. That I All right. <laughs> it, it was. Uh, I think it was in Olive Street, the yeah. prior Olive Street one. It just. Yeah. Well, that one is. Okay. I will go back. But they were all great. The rooms were all great. There was a typo in one of them, Carol. Instead of S I T E, still have to cite it was S I G H T. Okay. Cool. Got it. <laughs> So I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of September 25th, October 11th, and October 25th. Any second? A second. Krista, all those in favor? Those opposed? Uh, and then we have committees. Does everybody know about committees? So I sent you a list of the committees, but they're, they've changed and morphed. So um, we have so the planning board traditionally has had um, representatives sit on different committees that are also um, in other, um, have um, either are outside city um, organization or are part of city council or something. So the planning board right now has always had a representative on the capital improvements committee which, um, Mark, you can talk about um, the strategy there and what the Capital Improvements Committee um, does if you want to. We have the Technical Staff Review Committee, which is really just we need one person and then a backup if a person can't come. That's um, really sort of a, it's an early morning review at the very early, at, at a pre-submittal stage of permits so that the applicants can um, make sure that they're covering all the bases in the code and they're not submitting incomplete applications. Um, and um, it's helpful to have a planning board member sit there to sort of give the perspective of the planning board so that the applicant knows, um, you know, what they need to address when they finally, when they do eventually submit. They don't, uh, applications don't always come in after that, so sometimes projects just fall apart and you never see them again. Um, but we, it's really been a beneficial um, way to streamline the public hearing um, process so that the, the applications are, are complete and ready to go when they submit. The other people who come to that are like fire department and the building yep. Fire, building, 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 building,
all staff except for board members so sometimes a zoning board member might come if that's uh, applicable um, and otherwise it's like you said fire department economic development housing um, staff conservation commission staff and, um, and it's 7 30 like I mean 7 35 I mean I, I drop a child in the morning so they meet there's a once per month yep um, not so we only look at two projects in a on a given morning and you get half hour um, to show the plans and have discourse basically so if there's only one project on the um, on the agenda we would start at 8 and it would be run to 830 if there are two then it's going to go 730 to 830 and, and 830 is a pretty hard stop because everyone has to go to work if there are other jobs yeah <laughs> Um, so we try to start um, at 7:30, but not everybody shows up right at 7:30. Okay. So it's not. That's a good. I could, I could. I could do that. I, I struggle with that um, because it's somebody come in front of you, and then you forget about the project, and then nine months later, the applicant would be making a presentation, and I'd be looking around like, I didn't we already have this discussion. <laughs> 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 and then finally, like, why is everybody asking these questions? And like, oh, that's just me. It's technical. <laughs> Um, so, um, so yeah, we can run through and see, I'll just run through the rest of them, then you guys can decide. Um, a state uh, hospital citizens advisory committee is no longer because we're so far down towards completion of that project, um, but it was still on our on the books from last year. That's why it's there, sort of strike through. Um, transportation and parking committee. Um, it's sort of more of a policy committee, but it's comprised of people from DPW, police, um, um, our office, and then a city councilor um, is also typically chairs um, that committee. Um, and then there's the bicycle and pedestrian subcommittee of that committee. I think that's still a standing committee. I think. Um, Do you know when that one? Oh gosh, yes, it's on Tuesday mornings. It's the same. It's an early morning. It's like seven thirty, I think. Um, and it's the opposite day. Uh, um, they meet once a month, and it's not on the third Tuesday because we tried to make sure that they weren't overlapping. Mm -hmm. I have to double check with Wayne to see what date that what of the month that is. Then there's Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, we always have staff person always um, is an alternate and there's a and then we typically have someone from the planning board go I, they meet monthly right yeah they or always as they always meet it. on our meeting nights oh right so that's one yeah problematic thing like yeah like I have missed a couple of our meetings to go to some of their meetings but I haven't done that in a long time yeah so that so makes it a little bit more difficult yeah. but the um, you know, t so I think it's beneficial just to sort of hear what's going on in the region, but it's not critical yes. that someone's there every single meeting. Read Obviously, everything they send. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I read everything. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's hard because they always it always overlaps with with this meeting. Yeah. They do provide a nice little dinner, right? <laughs> Once a year, yeah. Jeez. Once a year. Buffet. I mean, it's not <laughs> <a buffet. laughs> saying. Oh <my> <laughs> standards okay. <laughs> the other critical one we really need to um, fill is a representative on the community preservation committee and so every every meeting Sarah Lavalley comes to me and says have you guys voted <laughs> <laughs> and it's like well we had so many things on the agenda we couldn't get to it <laughs> those are night meetings or morning meetings um, those are Wednesdays first and third Wednesday evening at 7 so they just met last night but it's all about giving away money, so it's kind of fun. <laughs> you evaluate projects. So and don't people run for that, though? Isn't that an old? So there's several elected? slots. OK. So there's two, there are two elected slots. There are two appointed slots. I have to look at the layout. And then there are representatives from um, planning board. Um, Historical from, commission. Yeah. and. Um, 
housing partners. The I think it's housing like partnership, that. yeah. So um, what would happen is if you all are very different people have, you know, I think the most recent, I think Devin was the last mm -hmm. representative um, mm -hmm. from the planning board. So it's been open since she left. Um, so those are the committees so far. Um, we did have housing partnership as a, as a mm -hmm. connection. I think Alan was the most recent person, but when, after your stint um, and I conversation with Peg Keller, who's the staff person for housing partnership, it didn't seem to make sense to have a regular, it made more sense from at the staff level when we we're discussing it to just have potentially like me or Wayne go to the housing partnership and give an update on what we're doing in terms of planning. Sometimes they come to us or ask us to come and talk to them about different zoning initiatives or what's happening in terms of development. Um, Peg, who's the staff person for the housing partnership, also comes to those tech reviews. So if there's a housing project or something, she knows about that sort of coming in. Um, but it seemed like there wasn't um, a lot, th there was a, an extra meeting, but maybe not so beneficial for a planning board member to come to be obligated to go to every <coughs> single one of those meetings. Mm -hmm. So that's the lay of the committees. And so we haven't, obviously, since we've had turnover in the last year, we haven't had a reassignment of these. I can be back up to the tech review because I'm that early anyway, so. Okay. So what typically happens is I would send out the notice to everybody and then just confirm with the point primary person and the backup to see, you know, if the primary person's available mm -hmm. and then default, then fall back to mm -hmm. the backup. Is somebody else interested in PVPC who wants to periodically miss these meetings? I mean, I'm happy to stay on it, but if somebody else feels like. So that's the one you could fulfill your subcommittee obligation without actually ever going to a meeting. I feel <laughs> they always <laughs> are on <laughs> Thursday night. I feel night. the guilt. Okay? <laughs> I feel the guilt. I, yes, correct. Uh, but if somebody else were interested in it, I'd be happy to. So it's, it's yeah. the other the, uh, the other side of that coin is the community preservation, which is two meetings a month on Wednesdays. Yeah. Yes. But that's a fun one. Cause that's you, a fun one. Right. Is it really fun? Well, because you give away money. So, <laughs> I mean, not to yourself. <laughs> that's why it is yeah, fun. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun yeah. you give away money? Are they time limited or are they, like, do they go like seven to eight or something? Or like seven well, it depends or? on what's on the agenda. So it's open. So it's like ours. Like, it's an open ended. Yeah, but they're usually not more than two hours, I think. Yeah. Yeah. They get usually a lot of public comment at certain points, but usually it's very supportive public yeah. comment, different than what we've experienced. <laughs> oh, they're supportive. Yeah. Jesus. That's, That's the opposite. Right. Nobody shows up well, to oppose ditto. giving away yeah. money. Right. Yeah. right. Exactly. <clears throat> Uh, so for CPC, if somebody, <laughs> what if like four months from now you're like, I can't, like I just can't do it? Is that, is um, that the end of the world? No. I mean, you would, you're like watching it happen, like <laughs> inability to say no, right? Like, Public shame. Like, <laughs> so, I, what, <laughs> sorry. I mean, it would be great to fill out the term, but yeah. obviously, if it's not working out, I'm sure there are a lot of people who would be interested in giving out money, so it probably wouldn't be a hard slot to fill. <laughs> Can you clarify, do all of us have to be on other committees? Are there actually, I don't think there, there are, are enough slots. for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, you don't. Just okay. a couple things. One is, if you're dying to do one of these things, you think it's so, it would be really great, that would be great to do that. If you, and if you feel like you have a little extra time, that would be great. The other thing is, like, for the transportation and parking, it's good to sort of be able to hear what's going on on the transportation policy level and see what things, because obviously that affects what, you know, some of it is they're evaluating where the high priority is for spending mm -hmm. for safety improvements. And so some of that's related to the permits that come through, there are traffic mitigation requirements, and you can sort of see that path of where that's going, but also to understand you know, um, 
plans and, and issues in the neighborhoods related to traffic. Um, but you can't necessarily, yeah. you don't necessarily have to be, you know, go to every single meeting either. I've, I've been doing that. I guess I'd be willing to keep doing it. Okay. Why did you want to be on that community preservation? Two nights a week? once a month I could do it but two feels yeah. like a lot, a lot for me right now and there are some months that they don't meet so um, right now they're sort of in the process of reviewing applications so they're d definitely meeting regularly mm -hmm. can I stay for community preservation sure <laughs> could sure. I would do the bike pet subcommittee too I just I, the, the Tuesday I just have to check I mean I, I know that I'm just physically not here every other Tuesday of every single week of okay. life. And so I would just have to double check the. Okay. Carolyn, could two of us share the CPC? I don't think you can do that. You can't. No. Mm -mm. So I'd be willing to do that so we had a representative on the board. Okay. That'd be CPC? Great. CPC. George. Yeah. You're so great. Well, I, I got a long history with the CPC. <laughs> a good one or a bad one? Is it coming? Well, I, I was the original co-chair to get it caught, kind of campaigning oh, to get wow. it on board. Yeah. And then five years later, when it came up to vote again, we had to do it again. And I'm thinking that it may be coming up again. To where, where it's not permanent? Years. It's not like It's not permanent. Yeah. Every three to five years, five it's got to come up five years. And then it, right now, it's a 3% surcharge, kind of tax mm -hmm. and, and then that's an opportunity for the community to say well maybe it should only be one percent or two percent or none every so five years you do that. Oh. yeah every five years so and that's that's a that's a big haul to pull together a campaign like that to do yeah. that. so mm -hmm. that's where you two will come so uh, probably <laughs> so. <laughs> you come see me when that <laughs> <laughs> so sam and you said you do you want to do tech review I'm dying to do tech review. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark? I'll be the backup. Backup. That's when Sam and then what about eyes. CIP? Yeah. What's that? Capital improvement? I'm not, I like that one. I'm staying on that one. Okay. <laughs> well, so then we're done. Bike ped. Oh, we just need bike ped subcommittee. And that's a Tuesday morning, early morning. Oh, it's a morning? I yeah. said a night. No, it's early morning. I mean, hmm. the bike ped. So it's different from what Alan does. It's a right. subcommittee of that larger committee. Yeah. Do you know their dates? It's a Tuesday. That's the one I have to say. <laughs> I mean, the other thing is, if nobody wants to jump on that one, I can go back at more information. I mean, I could probably look on the. I could do it. Now, I, yeah, I just need to know the dates so that I could, like, if it's if it's staggered when it's like a telework day for me. Yeah. Then I can do it. But if it's okay, if the alternate ones, then I, yeah, then I can't. So we could do the other ones and just leave that one yeah. for the next meeting if you want to do. But it, it would be great to get a motion, and you could do it all as a group, or you could do individual. Do what? Just, Just um, make a move, motion. Make a motion to fill the slots of the subcommittee. Sure, I'll as, make a motion. As discussed. <laughs> okay. Second. It's not second by Mark. All those in favor? What are you thinking, George? Not You're me. like, we need more no, discussion. I, I don't want to. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh. Just remember, the Bike and Pet Committee meets once a month. Yeah. And it's either like the second Monday or the second Tuesday of the month. Probably not Monday. It's a Tuesday. I know it is. A Tuesday. Yeah. So I just didn't remember. Or second yeah. or third. Tuesday. Yeah. yeah. But it's only once a month. I think it no, that's great. I, I just need the, the actual date. I see. I have all of my Mondays and Tuesdays mapped out so, uh, for really through the end of next year, like because I work in Cambridge every other week. That's exactly Here, I'm not here. Okay. So, okay. Uh, Great. A permit. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, I should tell, just though I don't want to leave the committee, just I should tell you about what Capital Improvement uh, Committee is. It's, it's, I enjoy it because uh, we're going through it right now. Every department of the city comes in front of us. There's a, there's a board of, I think there's four or five of us, and um, police department, fire department, rec department, IT, school department, every department of the city comes in front with their proposed budget for next year what they need, um, what they want, and it's a five-year projection. And then we put it all together, make recommendations to the mayor, and he puts the budget together. Cool. So, yeah, so it's, yeah, that's it's really fun. Cool. So it really gives you a sense of what's going on in the city. But you do it every year? It's like a cabinet. It's like, not 
it's not personnel no things like that it's no it's you know, trucks the and boilers tanks failing and at the lead school it's yeah. going to cost a hundred thousand dollars to fix so did, did you guys get the all the stuff with the police riot gear whenever that was earlier this summer that was um so things like that are uh we've been pushing for years we would get uh, riot gear um that was one of them and we would say is this a capital improvement or is this a um, should this just be a working budget, yeah. you know, item? Because they have to replace that stuff every year, right. um, hmm. and it used to come in front of us as a capital improvement uh, item, and then we recommended, and then there was riots in the streets about, <laughs> the, you know, the city's recommending um, riot, you know, fallout riot gear for the police, and we're like, no, it's just they're changing their vests because they're 10 years old, and they have to rotate them out because they're not safe anymore, things like that. But, um, hmm. but over the, you know. Seven, eight years ago, we didn't even meet because the city didn't have any money. There was no point in meeting. Now, and then uh, every department. I need a new washer. Girl, you have great timing. Maytag washer. We needed a new like, car for some admin purpose, and, and, and that didn't feel like that should have been an operating expense, not a capital expense. And so over the years, we've been able to streamline everything and get people to get the rec department to borrow Smith Vokes van instead of both people buying a van. And so it's been, it's over the years, it's gotten much, much better. No doubt <laughs> due to your efforts. Exactly. Well, Thank cool. you, Mark. But I don't want to give that up. It's, it's fun. <laughs> that's a fun one. No, that's cool. Um, that's really cool. So uh, I moved to um, go to sleep. <laughs> we have to do two more things. Okay. Um, chair and vice chair. chair, and vice chair. Chair. Chair one. Chair. Well, you didn't I'm officially, happy. yeah, you didn't officially vote for chair and vice chair, and technically I need to do a roll call vote. So someone needs to nominate the chair and a second, and then we do a roll call vote. I nominate Tess as chair. Thank Sucks. Yes. <laughs> so kind. <sighs> or cruel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so to, Sam. The previous, yeah? How do you, uh, oh. John? I vote yes. Okay. Yes. Mark. Yes. Sure. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 is it Should we eyes out? Is it good? Yeah. 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 I know. I didn't even bring yeah. gum now tonight. Now we need a, a vice chair. What does the vice chair do? Oh, yeah. You're back. Yeah. <laughs> So that one meeting when you skip to go to that other, there's that <laughs> meeting, that's fun. Right. <laughs> Nominate Mark? Yeah. I've, I've been there. Somebody else so needs that's to. That's why you'll be good. <laughs> your you? Well, who has seniority? Yeah. I'm pretty new. Huh? Me? Yeah. No. No. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 I say somebody who's not on a subcommittee should be. Ooh, good point. Vice good, point. <laughs> good point. Good point. Jana, what do you think? Uh, am I eligible to be vice chair? Um, yeah. Well, shouldn't it be yeah, somebody who has so little test experience? And, oh, yeah, I'm just kidding. What's that? You have a drug test and everything? Yeah. <laughs> I mean. Yeah, no. Um, no. Um, you, we need a full member. That's so. What I was thinking. Yeah. So, how about Mark? Good experience in that. You're good in that. I, I can't do it because I'm just uh, not good in that. Okay, so Alan moved Mark. <laughs> sure. Is there a second? I second. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a second? Sorry, Mark. Sorry. I second that. Yes. <laughs> and now roll call vote, Sam. Yes. Alan. He can't vote? Yeah, he can vote. Oh, you can vote for yourself. No. Okay. No. Because <laughs> no. there should always be a no, right? <laughs> Alan. Yeah. Uh, I'm a yes. Sorry. Oh, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 No, it's okay. just that I, I don't. No, that's fine. Better. I kill houseplants. Huh? I kill houseplants. So we all have yeah, our own I strengths. I uh, Sam, was there another? Is there a second? Second. Jana, all those in favor of adjourning. Yes. I was opposed. Alan, I really thought you were about to be opposed.